Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Charged Up. I believe this is 13? Unlucky 13, maybe? Um, as always, I am joined by the marvelous, the self-proclaimed marvelous one. Ah, crap, I almost gave you a pass. Um, the self-proclaimed marvelous one, my co-host, Ben. I'm coming for you, Jake Paul. I'm coming for you! <laughs> yes. And returning for the show, um, we've never had a return guest, so I wasn't really sure how to introduce that, is another Jake. Jake from State Farm. I mean, from Internet Unwind. Jake from Snake Farm. Yes. Jake from Snake Pass. Snake away? Uh, snakes on a plane? Snake away. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. I'm less poly than him. Good radio so far. Um, so in case you couldn't tell, I did mention last week that we're going to have some heavier topics this week. And uh, these boys just kind of wanted to discuss the whole like Jake Paul crap going on right now. And essentially the idea of like, you know, millennials ruining the uh, the, <laughs> the what, what is it like? Like millennials kill all these things. It's uh, millennials killing we're the killing, internet. We're, yeah. We're, uh, millennials, like, kill, er, millennials are killing movie theaters. Millennials are killing avocados. Millennials, millennials are killing, killing car dealerships. Yeah, basically they're killing the entertainment industry is the idea that we're going into, but in a joking way. Um, kind of specifically around Jake Paul, but also like some of the some other examples in the past, like some of the you know the child stars that like came up and and have gone crazy, like Justin Bieber and Miley Cyrus and things like that. But the most recent one's Jake Paul, so. I'm going to pass it on to you guys, because I don't really know this guy very well. <coughs> oh, sorry. Oh, God. That was a bad time. <coughs> oh, start. Oh, God. Okay. Yeah, so this is something I brought up because I I didn't know, preface, I did not who Jake, did not know who Jake Paul was. Um, A lot of the more, quote unquote, popular YouTubers. <coughs> oh, my God. Wow. <coughs> Are you I dying? This. Jake Paul's already putting a curse on me. Um, not just me today. Okay. Three, two, one. Uh, I will preface this in saying that I did not know who Jake Paul was until about a week ago. Um, in sort of the world of YouTube, I don't really follow the quote-unquote popular YouTubers. I guess the only one I would actually heard of was PewDiePie, and he has his own con- controversies, and he's part of this overall topic, and he's a relatively relatively young man, not as young as Jake Paul, but relatively young still. Um, but I didn't hear about him until I was scrolling to Twitter, as I do, and somebody had retweeted him about how um, he was caught. He was basically being nuisance for his neighbor, and me trying to give the kid the benefit of the doubt because I'm going to refer to him as a kid because that's what he is. He's a child. Um, like he was being a nuisance. I'm like, okay, what kind of shenanigans is this wound up to? And then you read it like how he was uh, basically causing being a disturbance in the entire neighborhood, um, and then I was like, okay, that's that's messed up and then i and then what set me off was the uh the interview he did with the uh with the reporter with the local news reporter and how just being the utmost disrespectful little shit i have ever seen in my life and i've seen a lot of disrespectful little shits um and following the subsequently i didn't know he was on the disney channel and it kind of blew my mind that that this guy was on the disney channel i was like man his brother what both on disney channel i had no idea um, and how Disney had separated his ways and, uh, Disney obviously released a statement saying that we, we decided to part ways with, yeah. uh, with this, with him. But of course his statement was, I've outgrown Disney. First of all, nobody outgrows the mouse. The mouse will outgrow all of us and it will consume all of us. We've talked about this before. Uh-huh. Um, and, and I just, and it sort of just set me off. Like I was, if you look at any of my tweets, I was pissed. I hate, like, and it's not a jealousy thing, because he has a lot of money. Um, it's not a jealousy thing. Um, but w- what I can tell about a person like Jake Paul and other people like him, other YouTubers who were started when they were 19, 20, or even younger, and now are super popular, who have loads of money, um, is that they are not held accountable. You can tell, and, and of course, uh, and the Philip DeFranco posted, uh, Philip DeFranco did a video on Jake, on Jake Paul and apparently there was a beef with this uh, producer who worked with uh, uh, H3A3 Productions, Evan Klein, Ethan Klein, Ethan Klein, um, 
and now he was basically, you know, he, he had him doxxed because he gave out his address by putting it online um, and all these other things. And I'm just thinking, who is holding this kid accountable? It's certainly not his brother. I'm assuming because when I read, I haven't really too much other brother. The, he's younger, and the brother is the older brother, correct? Um, I, yeah. If I think, yeah, his brother so, is actually like somewhat respectable. Like he is a you know he's a brand. He's got some stuff going for him, but he still defends his little brother. That's all I know. He's he's also done a lot of the same kind of immature, uh, really risky and and bad things. Like a VidCon, he did that thing where he hid three thousand dollars in an area he wasn't even supposed to go into and then told his fans that it was there and then went there himself and then created a whole situation where there was like a thousand people just running around this, this tiny area looking for $3,000 while he was there. Like it, it, it could have gotten so bad. You had people pushing each other over and just trying to beat each other up to take the money. There's any, any number of things that could have gone wrong and he didn't. Oh, I thought that was also Jake. No, that was him. That was Logan. Oh, okay. So they're both tools. Cool. But my overall, po- yeah, my overall point is, is, with these two, but specifically um, the Paul we're talking about, is that who he needs to be held accountable, and that it goes to show that this this is a person who has never worked a day in his life. Um, I understand that what he does is his job, and that's fine. But he doesn't. And I'm gonna sound like an old school fucking like person from the 1960s right now but like he doesn't know the meaning of hard work and i can tell just by looking at him he's probably never worked a day job in his life he's probably never had to wake up at at five in the morning get off by six at six in the afternoon and know what it's like to actually put a day's work he's just been goofing his ass off since his since he since he's been alive probably he's probably been a goofer a goober his entire life and personally and i've seen and, and we've seen this not just with youtube stars but with young child stars over the decades that you put somebody that young in this position with no accountability with the the world literally at their fingertips you know for all intents and purposes Logan Paul is a little bit smaller scale than say a big time Hollywood celebrity but he had access to a lot of things that most people his age don't um and it gives him a lot of privilege too and i think it's really dangerous to like where are his parents and more so why wasn't his i mean probably his brother i guarantee you his brother probably pushed him or he saw his brother doing these things and that led him to wanting to do these things and thus continuing this trend um and and i just think it's very dangerous and it's not just him uh, another situation in which if you guys remember the csgo lottery scandal mm-hmm. that happened last year <laughs> yeah um team martin you know, another popular young uh, YouTuber and who's more popular. Yeah. And Pro Syndicate, They were yeah. teams in that. Um, they were on a team in that, yeah. And they're both very young who have a lot of money. And they ran a gambling circuit because nobody was holding accountable. Nobody was watching them. And they're standing there in their 20s. They're wrong but adults. But to me, they're kids. To me, they're kids with a lot of money. Well, to be fair, that in that situation is a little bit different because the, um, the there was a whole lot of those sites. The big issue there was that they were... They were um not. They were claiming it wasn't theirs. They were claiming they were getting sponsored by this site. Right, right, right. When in right. reality they owned it. It wasn't necessarily the the um the existence of the site that they owned that was the problem. Just just want to clarify that. Yeah, it was it was out like outright ethical fraud basically. Yeah, it was yeah. it was it wasn't necessarily that um the, the that they were hosting a gambling site. I just want to make sure that was clear. Right. My point is that they did that and they didn't disclose it was because they thought they were untouchable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which apparently because otherwise done before. Apparently he didn't disclose. He apparently he's done it numerous times where he didn't disclose um, advertising deals. Mm-hmm. And there you go. There's that. There's that. I the ideology. And I understand everybody in their twenties. And Justin's going to get this more either that everybody in their twenties thinks they're untouchable. Mm-hmm. That the world is at my fingertips. And it's I think it's more dangerous with, with, when you have a lot of money at a young age. Um, you know, you see this a lot of prank tubers, and you remember the prank tuber, I, and I don't even want to look at their names because it was just uh, too messed up. Who faked his? Who faked? It, I think it was either faked his death or faked his friend's death. Um, it was very popular. Uh, or just yeah. look, and then you look at any prank tuber um, who's very popular in the quote unquote social experience because that's what they call them nowadays. Joey salads. Exactly. Um, ah, it it just it just makes me wonder why nobody is trying to teach these these kids 
I understand you have a persona to maintain. I mean, I call myself the self-proclaimed marvelous one, um, who's ridiculously over the top. But in the, the day, if say if I get interviewed by, say I don't know a YouTube news network, I don't know if those are the, that's the thing. I said a drama lawyer, which I have a nut. That's a that's a whole another can of worms. Well, if you think about it, Philip um, DeFranco falls into that category. There's a lot of those channels that uh, yeah, that do which that kind of thing. I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of that either. And Philip DeFranco, I like his content, but I'm just I'd rather he talk about other stuff. But that's another issue. Yeah. But yeah. I I can tell you one thing that makes it even weirder, um, because like you were saying, you don't understand why nobody's kind of holding them accountable and all. The strangest thing about it is um, Jake Paul is not alone. He's not just making this content. His Team 10 and all that stuff, they have investors. They have people, like, they have people investing money in them, according to um, a lot of different sources. I don't know who the investors are. I don't know if it's a company. I don't know what necessarily the investors are investing in, but they've got there's, there's people funding them. So... Not only that, he's also, like you said earlier, working for Disney. If he's working for Disney, you got to figure he's got to have some kind of an agent or a manager. He's got to have some kind of PR person, something. There's got to be a group of people there that are handling those deals. So what's crazy is that none of them are saying, hold up, wait a minute. You're, you're risking our reputation and your own. That's the weirdest part to me. Um... I do want to clarify and, something. And that goes something. back to the PewDiePie thing where he lost his maker uh, deal because of his actions. You know, they were like, we don't want to be associated with this behavior. So they dropped him. So again, like like you said, that really can affect a lot of people. Yeah. Sorry, continue. Um, I do want to clarify, though, the, you, what you said earlier about H3H3, like the, the person that was doxxed. It was not even H3H3. Post Malone was the person. That's what that, I meant, yes. Yeah, yes. Post Malone is a friend of H3H3's and... Um, Ace Ray Ace did a couple videos about the whole situation. Um, Post Malone happened to be on a couple of those, and he kind of joked around with them. He ordered some gear, and <laughs> they contact when they found out that he had ordered the merchandise of Jake Paul's that they ordered. He ordered as a joke. They were gonna just like wear it and joke around during a podcast or something, and Jake Paul actually found out about it because Post Malone tweeted it out as a joke. Then they found out. They contacted the company that produces the merchandise and ships it out, had them ship it to Jake Paul's address instead. Then Jake Paul took the address that legally he shouldn't even have and went there himself. That's how he even got it. So legally he wasn't even supposed to have the address. Um, So he pulled a whole bunch of strings to get that illegal and address. And then subsequently, Ill like potentially illegally filmed uh, Post Malone yes. um, from afar, even though... You know, he said we were vlogging up close. There was, I don't think, as of, as of right now, I don't know if Post Malone knew, knows, he probably knows by now, that um, he was being filmed from afar. Yeah, well, he not only not only that. Yeah, he asked, can I film this, but he was already that filming That was what I was going to say, point. is legally they're in kind of a gray area there because he was already recording, but he did give him permission. So legally he did record him when he didn't know, but he kind of can get away with it, unfortunately. It, it's a shame, but he actually can get away with it. Um, the, the, the sad thing is this all comes back to, I actually put up a video yesterday about, um, uh, uh, criticism versus hatred because, um, a lot of YouTubers, including Jake Paul now, uh, have, have this, um, this thing where they're, 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 uh, calling people that criticize their bad behavior or criticizing stupid things they do as being a hater. So h 3 h made fun of a video and so did PewDiePie, even though Jake Paul called PewDiePie out in his song Every Day, Bro. That's when all this stuff started happening. Because, well, not the neighbor's situation, but that's when things started really kind of escalating. Snow snowballing. Yeah. Um, it's just kind of a coincidence, I think, that it kind of started around the same time that he was really agitating his neighbors, plus he started catching flack from other people. The song was, you know, dog trash. It was, it was garbage. <laughs> um, and people criticized it. With good, re I mean, one of the le one of the lines is "England is my city," from a person who's British. England's the country, not the city. <sighs> Do you not even <laughs> know your own geography? Um, but uh, there was a whole bunch of problems in the song. He called PewDiePie out, acting like he's gonna you know pass PewDiePie in the next couple months, and all this other stuff. People criticized the stupid stuff in the song, and then he uploads a video 
talking about the haters and like how he, you know you can't let the haters get you down. I'm gonna dab on them haters. The neighbors, they they don't have a legitimate concern, little legitimate issue in one of his videos. He talked about like they don't have a legitimate thing to complain about. You gotta dab on them haters. Okay, so anyone that has a problem, I don't with even know what hater, a dab is. It's this. It, they, it's supposedly a dance move where you demonstrate shove your for the arm people. Like that. There you go. <laughs> That it that's what okay. it's supposed to be. That stupid thing. They call it a dance wow. move. Wow. That is a dance move. It's a reverse Nazi salute. The, it's basically it how little way, kids say way. hello now. Yeah. Oh my word, uh, my sister. I can't talk to my sister anymore. Um, <laughs> We're so old. I, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, but um, yeah, but like he he takes these like his catchphrase is I'm gonna send it. I, what? Yeah, that's that's his catchphrase. I've heard somebody that's say that it's catchy. I've heard somebody say that it might be something to do with his show. I haven't been able to figure out where it comes from, but I got tired of looking. So I just I really don't care anymore about, you know, his stupid catchphrase and a lot of his stupid behavior. Um he he did he, Zero, did you get a chance to watch the um the Keemstar interview? No, I totally forgot about it. Uh <laughs> He, a lot of the video, he seems kind of rational. He seems kind of like, okay, you get the feeling that, yeah, he kind of just, you know, he's a stupid kid making stupid, stupid mistakes, which the problem I have with that is I've seen a lot of YouTuber, a lot of YouTubers actually defend him with that, uh, with that mentality. Mm -hmm. Um, the problem is in no person's mind should the rational uh, thing to do when somebody comes to talk to you about the fact that you're being sued be to climb on the news van. Um, not only that, then there's the, uh, then there's the, uh, the whole, uh, when, when he's, when he's like, he admits, yeah, it's a horrible situation living here, but there's nothing I can do about it. Well, yeah, there is. Stop being a jerk off. Yeah. You could stop setting fires. Yeah. That he's the, the size of your house. Um, and then he accused his neighbors of unbolting the, the one of the tires to their car, but apparently they parked it down the street. Then the the like two nights before the the accident actually happened, so it wasn't even parked in front of their house. They have no proof that the neighbors did it. They all they know is that someone was seen at the van, but no one no one thought to check the tire when they saw somebody messing with the tire. Like something doesn't make sense about that. But he accused the neighbors of trying to kill them. He accused them of attempted murder. Yeah, okay. that's not that's not a simple. I'm young and immature. That sounds that is, Yeah, something's off with that. And um, the it, it, but in the in the interview in the interview, um, I'm gonna jump right to the end of it because about about like five ten minutes towards the end of the video, it was like a 15, 20 minute interview. Um, all of a sudden he starts seeming like real sketchy. Like he starts getting really nervous that Keemstar is being sarcastic and and. Uh, joking around with him and not being serious in this interview. He starts accusing him of being unprofessional and immature. Um, which, like I told you <laughs> in that message, it, it just points right to insecurity, for one. And for two, it points to him maybe even being doing something sketchy. The whole interview started from, from the minute he started acting strange. It just continued to feel like he was... Um, like this was not actually him doing an interview. This seemed like it was just damage control. From then on, because everything he said after that felt sketchy, like he was trying to be extra careful, um, as if the whole point of him going on there was to get out of hot water, which it, there's only so much this is going to clear up, even if you're telling the truth. Kind of kind of to that point, like I again, I can't really talk about the old like Jake Paul thing itself. I've watched the the PewDiePie, uh, not the PewDiePie, the Philip DeFranco stuff about him. That's about the extent of my knowledge. Um, but kind of to touch on what you were saying like how you know it's essentially like it's it's you know hiding insecurities and things like that like i think that is a major factor here that we're not really like focusing on like yes he's a jerk it's awful like you know he shouldn't be like that but also the, he has like millions of views on every video he puts out where he's being a tool and people love him for it so like even if he wanted to be different he has an audience expecting him to be a certain way and honestly, I think part of all this, so, you know, he said he he outgrew Disney. Like, I'm not defending the guy. Don't get me wrong. Um, He said he outgrew Disney and, like, wanted to, you know, get into different business endeavors and, like, try other, you know, acting opportunities and things like that. It sounds like he's basically just using this as a springboard for fame so that he can, like, you know. Oh, he get... says that in the interview. No, I know. But, like, so he can get out of that and, like, you know, become, like, a, a proper actor. Like, 
Disney holds people back and he was just using that to, to get an audience. Then he uses that audience to get more of an audience. And then he can use that to become like the next Harry Styles and be a, you know, Dunkirk two or whatever. Like they could possibly be, this is all a facade. He is an actor. Apparently mm-hmm. um, I didn't know that at first, but he is an actor apparently. So who's to say that this isn't just another persona for him, another character he's playing to get this audience. And then he'll go legit and not have to worry about YouTube anymore. Because who cares what people think about him when he's not on YouTube anymore? Well, the problem I see with that, though, is there's a lot of Disney movies that are not kids' movies. I mean, if you think about it, there's the whole Marvel cinematic universe, which is through Disney. Even if he couldn't get into that, I'm, that's just one example of a whole lot of movies where he could have even gotten extra roles and gotten more How many more Disney exposure. Channel stars have you seen in Marvel movies? Not many, but how many, <laughs> I mean... Uh, how many of them are going for those roles? We don't know. I don't know. I'm just saying, like, I feel like he's just basically using all this as a springboard. Like, you know, they always say all press is good press. So, like, whatever gets him on the news, that's all he cares about, probably. And yeah, but eventually, it... like, people will know his name, but they won't know what he's done. Like I said, the, you know, Logan Paul, like, he apparently he's the one that did that thing at, what was it, Comic-Con, you said? Um, But, like, now... Or like, VidCon. VidCon, yeah. He's, like, I think that was last year or something. Um, he actually yeah, has a pretty legit, legit like, business line. Like, he does uh, merchandising and stuff like that. And, like, he's considered the respectable of the two. Yeah. Even though just last year, he ha. was in the same position. So, like, it all, all that matters is you get your name out there. It's advertising. And, you know, he could also just feel pressured by this audience to continue doing this stuff. Look at, like, Justin Bieber, for example. He was, like, in a really bad place for a while you know, going all crazy and stuff. Like, he had his acting out years, like, in his early 20s or whatever. Uh, I think it was late teens, early 20s. And now, like, he's, you know, he's, like, staying out of the public. He's canceling concert appearances. He's doing all this stuff trying to stay away from the people that adore him. And, like, I think there was one example where he went out on a, on a uh, for a concert and was trying to, like, between songs, he was, like, trying to talk to the audience and, like, you know, be real with them. And they just kept, like, screaming and wooing and, like, they wouldn't listen to him. Uh, they were just like so excited to be there that they wouldn't stop screaming. And he's like, can, can you can you guys shut up? Like, I'm trying to, you know, I'm, I'm trying to like be real with you. Here. And sure, it's a concert. They're not there to listen to him preach. But it's that idea of like he feels like he can't be a person because he's a public figure and he just has to be what his audience wants him to be. So maybe it's the same situation here or it's just a tool. Who knows? <laughs> the only issue I have with that mentality, though, is he he's put out so many videos trying to get sympathy from his fans um, to try and get them even more on his side during this whole thing. But none of them, none of them are leaving him anyway. He's, he's um, he, he has tried a whole bunch of different things like experimenting on his channel, putting out that music video and putting out all these different types of types of videos. Like he even, I saw, I saw when I was looking into some of his stuff before he had a video where it was literally just one of his friends acting as a counselor between him and what, is supposedly his wife, but I don't know that for a fact. I I didn't care enough to find out about his actual relationship. Um, But it's just them sitting at a table. I actually was curious. I was like, is this legit? Clicked on it. And I just started clicking through the video. There are no cuts in it. that I could tell it's, it was just them sitting at this table with the, the built the onboard camera mic and them just sitting there with a friend between them kind of while they go back and forth. It was supposed to be like marriage counseling. He's experimenting. He's figuring out what works for him. And right, to he the, gets to the note that he's no trying to get sympathy does. from his audience, like he's he's not necessarily getting sympathy f- like from them. He's using them to he's connecting with them so that they'll defend him in other cases. If he tells you know the millions of people that watch him like religiously, hey, like I'm just trying to do me, and the, all these people are trying to get me down. Like he's not defending himself to them. He's using them to defend him to other people. Right, no, I know. He was trying to get them to, yeah. Like for instance, he did a couple. He did at least one video where he was actually making fun of the videos that people did making fun of him when he did his song. Mm-hmm. Like he actually he made fun of H three H three for um, calling the fans uh, for referring to a single Jake Pauler as Jake Pauler uh, instead of Jake Paulers. And then a few seconds later, <laughs> they then started talking about wait. Ethan was watching, look at this is an old video. So he must be a Jake Pauler. So they made fun of him for saying Jake Pauler. Then two seconds later, 
referred to it as a Jake Pauler. They they make the, they've made quite a few videos where they tried to make these other people look stupid when they're not being stupid to try and get their, their get their fan base like built up against these other these other YouTubers. Um, whereas like H three H when they do it, it's when they do stuff like that, it's it's not. Uh, it, it's pointing out flaws. It's not like insulting. They were being insulting in the videos I watched. Um, that's fair. So, random side note: his audience is called Jake Paulers. Yes. Yeah, it's literally who, just who ERS to the that? end of his name or ER. Who I'm took the him. literal two no seconds idea. to come up with that? Like even like Logan Paul has a similar thing where it's just his name with another addition to it, but his is the Low Gang. That's not Whereas bad. Jake Pauls are the Jake Paulers. Yeah, Low Gang is actually kind of kind of catchy. I would have gone Logan ears. But, but... Uh... Yeah, that's because you're old. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean they they. They could just be called the Paulers. Like, that's at least yeah. better. Wow. Yeah, that's I, I don't, I don't get it. Well, you know, look at his, look at, look at his, his uh, fan base. They're, I am. They very sound like it sounds like his mature. audience is possibly worse than him because they're supporting that kind of behavior, whether he wants to do yes. it or not. I'm not arguing hit that. I'm just saying, like, the fact that he has such a big audience for that means that they're worse. So I'm going to call mm. them all Jacobs. <laughs> Uh, maybe that's why I should call my fan base if I ever have one. Um, the it's pretty, uh, it's pretty good. Yeah, I'm gonna have to. I'll have to credit you in every single video, though. Dang it! Yeah, I gotta write that down. Um, money, money. anyway, <laughs> <laughs> Can just I just wanted to conclude it. What I was saying earlier is that I you know and where I lost my mind for a moment is that I get having an online persona, right? I mean, like I said earlier, I go I call myself the self proclaimed marvelous one, right? Um, even though I know we're near the status of a person like Jake Paul or any of these other popular YouTubers, but even though like you could say throw it's, he's a kid and securities, blah, 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 whatever. At the end of the day, you are the figurehead of a business. You're the figurehead of a brand. And when there is a certain way that I was raised and when you're in business, you should be taught these and I guarantee he was, and he probably has people encouraging him to act like his persona 24 seven. Yeah. There's a certain way you conduct yourself when talking with people, when it's not doing your show. Um, a, a, a big example of this, and he's not young and this is maybe that's why, but, uh, Jim Sterling, Jim, if you, if you don't know who he is, uh, Jim Sterling runs a weekly Monday show, talks about video games, who is this very much, um, thank God for me sort of everything is about me and then talks about, you know, a topic. That's his stick. It seems very over the top, egocentric, me, 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 me. But when you actually meet the guy and hear him in podcasts or the interviews or on, even on Twitter, he's possibly one of the most nicest human beings you've ever seen. Um, genuinely nice. When you look at Jake Paul, and again, I haven't seen the Keemstar interview because I refuse to watch anything keemstar related i just out of a personal Same. boycott of his he's um, he's not as bad anymore but i get it i i, I can't <laughs> i can't no matter what well because of what he what he's brought yeah to youtube yeah um he's he's venom anyways um when i look at i was more referring to that when the uh the news crew came to his house and the conduct the, the interview that that poor interviewer just trying to get an interview trying to be his professional and you have this idiot who can't bother to stop for five minutes and just explain himself conduct himself in a proper adult manner and just lay out everything out instead he has to act like a like a child and quote unquote dab um, and do all this dumb shit. There's a time and a place for your persona. Your videos are a time for your persona. Panels are a time for your persona. Conventions are a time for your persona. When you're conducting interviews with people who don't, who are not associated with your channel, when it's just a simple interview, your persona is not ready. Don't bring it out then. It's unprofessional and it makes you look like a big dick. And personally, and and yeah, I I could believe you that he he's insecure about himself. I could believe that. I could definitely believe that. At the same time, it does not excuse any of his behavior. And to me, anybody, and I'm saying you're using a zero, but I've seen people do it where they're using his age, they're using his potential insecurity, <laughs> his potential mental problems as a reason. Like, no, he needs somebody, 
needs, and this is going to be an old school reference, someone needs to take him back of the woodshed and handle business. Because that's what he needs. <laughs> that's exactly what he needs. Yeah. And I don't feel like he's ever had that in his life. And that may sound harsh, but I feel like that's what he needs right now. And his his brother's not helping. His fan base isn't helping. His his other team, his whole team, somebody, there has to be a rational person on that team that says, okay, you need to stop. Because da- eventually it's going to damage his brand to the point where even fans, I guarantee you, because eventually it starts with the outsiders and slowly but surely you whittle away your fan base. Look what happened to PewDiePie. Even though PewDiePie still has a huge audience, a lot he doesn't have the amount of people as he did before. Uh, so that's my point, is that I, I hope this kid f- ha- gets somebody in his team or learn or takes a look inside himself and says, you know what, I do need to learn to separate myself. I do need to know when to do this, when to do that, and when something is too far. Yeah. Um, just to kind of continue being devil's advocate, cause- I mean, I think we all agree that he's he's a douche and, you know, you shouldn't be like that. But for the sake of discussion, I want to kind of play devil's advocate and see all sides of this because it's a fun right. way to take these discussions. Um, there's there's kind of two things that I feel like are being a little bit lost here. Um, one, you mentioned that, you know, there like there's a time to have your persona and there's a time to, like, deal with business. And business has changed. Um, the Internet has affected the way people do business. If you look at, you know, for example, the the Wendy's social media campaign is a good example of that. Um, Because, like, they got a lot of, you know, publicity and, like, uh, reputation online for having the the sassy Wendy account on Twitter. I was going around, like, you know, trashing all these other companies and, like, getting blocked by Hardee's and all this stuff. And, like, like, that was, I mean, it's on on a much smaller scale, obviously, because it's just, like, being sassy on Twitter. But it's still that idea of, like people take a note when you, you know, back talk others and like act out and things like that. It's like, Oh, they're fun. Like they're not just following the rules. I like them. And so like, of course, you know, Jake's going to have this persona because it's what people are interested in. Again, I think some of it comes down to the audience being the problem, not necessarily him. Yes, he did this, but he probably like, he's kind of like that already again, as a, you know, security measure. Um, I go, I'm, I'm kind of a dick to, you know, protect my, my feelings. Um, and so like, if you act like that and people respond to it, it's like, oh, that works. I'm popular now. And you keep doing it. Look at anyone in high school. <laughs> All the popular kids are the bullies. Um, so there's that aspect just, you know, from a business standpoint, it worked for him. So he doesn't want to put that down because then people see, oh, that's not really him. He's just faking it. And then he loses that entire audience base because it's just an image. It's not an actual, like who he is. Uh, He has to keep it up. Um, But the second side of things is kind of an age thing. I mean, I'll, again, I'll talk about this more in depth later, but everyone goes through that phase where, you know, they aren't really sure who they are. They're figuring themselves out, all that stuff. He's going through that same thing right now. He's trying to figure out what he wants to do. He started out a Disney star. That's got to be really confusing when you're young, you know, like, and act- and suddenly come into money and fame and are on, you know, a very popular show, I, I assume. I'd never heard of it, um, but I also don't really watch Disney. And so he's adapting to that and then gets a YouTube base, which I assume he had before the show. But, you know, it ramped up, obviously, once he got on it. No, it was fine. Um, oh, OK. Well, still. Um Yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's, again, it's adapting to that larger audience and feeling the pressure to keep, you know, pleasing them, entertaining them, whatever the case is. And ultimately, like all of us, you know, at that age are attention seeking. Um, We come to some point eventually where we realize, you know, who we are, what, like what we're going to do, where our place in life is. And we accept that or keep challenging it. Some people well into their forties, but um, for the most part, you know, you figure it out. You don't need that attention anymore because you understand yourself and who you are. Um, he's not to that point, but the difference between like, you know, us like trashing him for being that way and him being in it is that cameras are always on the famous people. So sure. It's easy to say, well, he doesn't always have to be like that. But when everyone is out there, like trying to record him and, you know, like, like paparazzi are out there, like. If he's not on his game, if he's not that person, they'll know. 
it's like the uh who's the the comedian um that was like a like a method and it was always uh man on the moon the movie man on the moon who's that about oh i know here it's someone i can't a- remember his andy name warhol was that it kaufman andy kaufman or and andy kaufman right i think it was andy kaufman yeah yeah him like that's another example like i mean obviously he's no jake paul he was a you know famous for different reasons but he played a character every moment of his life on stage off stage always that's who he that's who he became even that wasn't who he was um you could argue that with a lot of comedians you know they're they're secretly hiding depression while going out for an audience and and like all these people that you know have committed suicide and everything they're like their family and friends say, I didn't know anything. Like they were always, they always seem so happy. Everyone has their demons. It's just a matter of what they show people outwardly. So again, I'm not defending this guy at all. I'm playing devil's advocate, but Mm -hmm. I feel like we don't know enough about him to really say like, Oh, well, you know, he might have insecurities, but he's still a dick. Um, who knows what he's hiding? Well, He's he's done things calling people out before before anybody said anything about him. Um, that's that's a sign of immaturity. But I mean, he's he's like I said, he's got all these people that are supposedly managing his his affairs and all that, and no one's stopping. Like setting, he set a fire in his pool that almost that reached almost to the top of his house in <laughs> the <laughs> one of the most you know uh, prone to wildfire areas of the country. And isn't Ella, isn't California one of the only states that has to deal with drought on like a yearly basis? Yeah. So so yep. they 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 don't have water to just throw at a fire that some kid decided to start. I've seen yeah, him in multiple great. interviews um, where they're kind of interviewing him about being a, a great businessman and all this other stuff, and he's kind of acting like he's such a great businessman and he's got all this stuff under control. He knows what he's doing. He's, he's doing. He's making steps. This this and this. Talking about how um you know he. He got into vlogging because he saw when he uh got when Vine was going down he saw uh, an opportunity where there was there's vlogging but no one's really innovated on it no one's really done anything different he doesn't do anything different than any other vlogger matter <laughs> of fact he does the least effort content out of other vloggers the, what's different is he mixes other people's types of content like one of the um that news that news report they were showing pictures of what was like um dude perfect type content being shot in their house um setting fire to the like in, in that that was just stupid um there was um like what there's he, he supposedly supposedly he doesn't want his fans outside of his house they didn't post the the address online they 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 don't know who did it they've been trying to pay people to take it down they were trying to pay people that its job is to go their job is to go and pull this content off the internet so people can so people will stop knowing where they live mm-hmm. um and people keep re-uploading it he says which at this point yeah but um, you can't get anything but off the internet. If that was, but if that was the case, then why would you go out? Like, I don't know if the footage of him riding the dirt bike down the street was from the news report, um, or if it was from a vlog of his. I couldn't tell whether whether it was uh, from from the vlog or the news report. But regardless, if that was the case, and you didn't want your fans there, like he claims he doesn't want the fans there, and has claimed he didn't want the fans outside the house, then why would you go out and encourage them to be there by going out and interacting with them? Why would you not go out and say, "Hey guys, this isn't cool," you, you know, this is this is our our personal space. We need to, you know, it's nice to meet you all, but you know, we could set up a meetup or something. Like that. No, instead he's doing, all, but he's he's supposedly he he acts like he's a great businessman and he, all these different things, but then he's making these things that contradict his own words. Um, so he's it just sounds like manipulation. That's why I don't want to get. That's why I can't really just give him a pass of any level. Um. Because of his age, because he, he he is professing to be something, and all of these people that are supposedly uh, giving him money to do this stuff, and and give and and behind him and taking care of his affairs, you're telling me none of them is saying anything about this, and he's not just going, yeah, no, it's okay, we'll just do it anyway, or something like that. Something has to be happening. Why else would, you know, it's it, I can't, I just there's there's too much that has happened to just give him a pass, um, and I would say I I, I would. Even during even during what we've been talking about here, with the side of a couple of jokes like directed at him for you know like like calling him a jerk off, that's mostly just a joke. I don't really think he's a yeah. jerk off. He's probably a, a nice off. guy. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, I, I I wouldn't say there, that any of this has been. Um, I can't remember the word you word the word you actually the word you used. Um, but I wouldn't say any of this has been um, 
this is mostly in criticism of his of his bad behavior. I wouldn't refer. I wouldn't say any of this was um, anything more than that. Right. No, I understand. No, I, yeah. I'm I'm mostly playing devil's advocate to Ben because I I yeah. think it's just enraging him more, and that makes me laugh. <laughs> no, it's not. No, because I fully expected you to do that. So I've I am one with my inner Hulk. Cool. Cool. Uh, cool you cool. will not get the rage out of me. Jake Paul has already gotten my Hulk out. Um, Hulk out with your bulk out. But yeah, but I agree with Jake. Yeah, but I agree with Jake that, that he's been there's been too much shit that he's done for me to like uh, excuse anything he's done or to feel sorry for him. I can't. I mean, if it was one or two things he had done, I, w- I would have said, yeah, he's young, he's stupid, he's made a couple mistakes. But I mean, so many people have, you know, you know, say, hey, look, you can't do this. And I and you got to figure there's probably a lot of people that have told him privately as well as people who have publicly called him out. So it's. It, He's got to have plenty of uh, friends in the. Uh, he's he's a big he's a big guy. He's got plenty of friends in the vlogging community, so you got to figure they're, that some of his friends are like, yeah, you gotta not do that. That's not cool. Chill. <laughs> You're making us all look bad. That that there's there's a lot of YouTubers that agree, that agree that his behavior reflects poorly on the entire community. He I believe claimed in the interview with Keemstar that uh, he can understand where they're coming from, but he doesn't believe it's true. Uh, that when he's on the on the on on um, the news, climbing all over news vans and ripping his dirt bike down the street in a rural area that he's not even supposed to have it in, really, aside from sitting in his garage, that you know that doesn't reflect poorly on YouTubers when they say top level YouTuber Jake Paul on the news. Like it, it. Well, probably all he sees is the money that's coming in, the views that are coming in, the audience he's getting from it. He's like, no, that reflects great on us because people want to see that. That's all he sees. It's the audience, again, it's the audience that's causing this to be, you know, appreciated. If they weren't watching, he wouldn't do it. That's the issue I'm getting at. Like, regardless of how terrible he is, I'm not denying that. I'm saying, Mm -hmm. like, the people that are supporting him, that are, you know, watching him, that are probably giving him watching the news. things directly <laughs> like they're the ones that are making all of this happen he's just doing what youtubers do he's giving them the content they want and again that doesn't yeah, make him a good the, person but it makes the audience worse <laughs> his his fan base are very young impressionable kids though for the most part there's not a whole lot of adults that watch his content so the the majority of his fan base are not watching the news so they're not going to see that on the news so i mean if that was just you know him not thinking i mean he, that i i haven't seen anybody say that that what he did on the news is good except for kids yeah but are you saying that these kids don't know that this this should be bad behavior i don't know i mean they're saying he's savage on the news which what does that even I mean? I know. I, I hate it. I hate it, and I haven't found a good way to really... It means he doesn't care really... about the rules. Ugh. Yeah, he's straight, by the definition, pollen. it means he's uncivilized, which is true. Yeah. Um. But, yeah, no, it's... it's. Yeah, I don't know. I just... Ugh, I'm about all. I'm about out of words for Jake Paul at this point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to end it. I'm going to end it with my opinion is that he needs to be taken behind a woodshed. And business needs to happen. <laughs> yeah, that that's it. He and he needs he needs an old school butt whooping. That's what he Bear needs. bottom at, at this point. Devil's advocate aside, I find all of this appalling. Yeah, we're gonna move on. Uh, this is this this yeah. discussion went way longer than I it was a heavy wanted topic. it to. My my mouth is it a little bit to be full said. of bile after all that. <laughs> <laughs> now you know why I didn't want to go any lucky because it makes you feel yucky even just by the basic level stuff. Yeah, basically. Uh, but yeah, so my topic, just to kind of transition from that, um, actually kind of smoothly transitions, if I'll get on with it. Um, I want to kind of give a little, like, personal journey of what I call the, like, the decade of the transformative 20s. Um, and I don't mean 1920s, I mean, like, the age of the 20s. The roaring 20s! <laughs> yeah. Ladies and Let's gentlemen, take a trip back through time, shall current. we? Through the roaring 20s. It was a- Zero is gonna be our stand-up comedy act today. <laughs> Zero. How the fine people doing today in Minnesota? Why are you Canadian? I don't know why I said Minnesota. I don't know. You sound like a South Park Canadian. Know. I was I was just thinking. I, yeah. Hey, brother. Um. Anyway, so yeah, I like, you know, I, I've mentioned before how I like didn't exactly you know grow up privileged or you know, really in, in any way um, benefited from my from my uh, upbringing. 
Um, so I, of course, graduated, you know, high school at 18 and immediately went to college. Um, and by my early 20s, uh, I realized that I like my high school did not prepare me for college. Um, I say all this because I'm actually like, you know, I'm headed on a good path right now, like in 2017, leading into the end of my 20s. So just for clarification, um, I finally figured it out a little bit. Um, <laughs> but going into my 20s, I had uh, basically after my first year at college, I lost all my scholarships because I wasn't doing well. Um, and by, you know, age 20 ish, I was on academic probation. Um, I went to school for theater. Uh, because like all through high school, I had kind of gotten into theater. Um, I took like a class on uh, digital production. Um, so I learned all about like Photoshop and like Premiere and a little bit on After Effects. And we had to like uh, shoot like a little commercial thing, um, which I actually put on my YouTube page a long time ago. But I don't really promote it because it's pretty embarrassing. <laughs> I think I actually remember seeing and, that. Yeah, it was a little like 30 second Pokemon card commercial. It was a lot of fun, but it's embarrassing to, sh- to talk about. Um and we had to learn all that stuff. It was really fun. And so I was like, I want to go on that path. Like, I want to, you know, I want to act. I want to direct. I want to write. Um, growing up, I didn't really have friends. So I spent a lot of my time, like, writing stories and, like, you know, kind of creating my own worlds and things like that. That's why I played video games, all that stuff. So, yeah, by the time I got to college, I, like, I wasn't mentally prepared. I wasn't socially prepared. I wasn't educationally prepared because my high school wasn't great. Um, so I ended up failing out. Um and so there was a kind of a period in there where I was pretty much just doing theater and trying to like get my grades back up in community college, um, which ended up not going well. I didn't get back in. Um, so I just like, I just didn't do college for a little while. Um, I worked part time at Walmart when I was like 23, like way too old to be starting minimum wage at Walmart um, <laughs> and uh, did some community theater stuff. Um, my like my crowning achievement uh, again, when I was like 22, 23, something like that, uh, was the community theater that I had done a few plays with. Um, let me redirect my own like full play because uh, I directed a few one acts, like one in high school. And then like when I first got to college, um, I took it upon myself. Like I got a, a script from a, um, a local, like one of my theater friends, um, like got like did my own auditions for a cast, like put it all together, uh, got a like stage manager, found the venue. Um, like set everything up for a two night show and it went really well. I was super happy. So I kind of wanted to keep doing that stuff. So like getting a community theater show was actually really cool to me because uh, they have a certain number in their, in their season. They let me do one, whatever. Got it all together, got it cast again, everything. Um, and I was so focused on like the directing side of things. Cause again, that's what I wanted to do. I didn't care about the rest that I didn't really like prep the, like the, you know, behind the scenes type stuff, like getting props prepared, getting costumes ready, things like that. So we're about a month, a month and a half away from uh, Curtain, you know, the show going up. Uh, it all looked really good. Everyone was getting off their lines and everything. And the group pulled me aside to say that, you know, basically because I'd been neglecting these things, they were afraid that I wouldn't be able to get the show up in time and canceled it. Um, like all the work that I and my cast had put in, like I was devastated. Like this is, you know, my crowning achievement of my 20s so far. And it was squashed. Um and it was a really low point. Like, I know it doesn't sound like probably much to anyone else, um, especially after we just talked about, you know, Jake Paul, like, burning a, a village down, basically. <laughs> um, but to me, it was a big deal. And um, I had some, you know, some hard times for a little while. Like, I was already kind of struggling financially um, because I was just working at Walmart, trying to live, you know, like, no college. Like, uh, I, I, was ru- I was running off of financial aid for a while, uh, so I didn't have that anymore because I wasn't in school. Like, all this stuff. Um, and so that was kind of, like, you know, the, the final straw. Um, I'm not saying I was suicidal or anything. That's not that's not my way. But, um, you know, there's a lot of highs and lows, basically. And so that's when I, you know, moved away to try, like, to start over. So I was like, there's nothing else for me here. I was here for the theater and a few friends, but I could still see them. Um, so I moved down to where I am now. Uh, the plan was to get back in school, you know, get all that sorted out. Um, just kind of like start over closer to family, you know, some better financial help, a new chance to like find a better job, things like that. Uh, this is when I was, uh, I guess 24. Um, the literally like three or I guess four months after moving down here, um, I met Brooke who's, you know, now my fiance and like, I was living with my brother, uh, just kind of, you know, for the, for the support, whatever. 
Um, still working at Walmart. I transferred down there and was still kind of shaky. I started back up in school basically just to get my associates again. Um, and, you know, had a, had a good relationship, had, was getting by as far as work was concerned and was finally back in school. Um, it took, I think the, a year, uh, to finish up the program I was on cause I had bit gone from a theater major to a communications major and then, you know, failed out. So I'd taken some of my, like my gen ed stuff, but most of it was the theater classes that I cared about more and none of that was going to transfer. The school I went to didn't have any kind of theater or communications program or anything. So I just did like general business. Um, so things like, you know, my math classes, like basic stuff like that already happened, but I had to basically completely start over, which is why I'm just now graduating four years later. Um, I, yeah, literally had to start over. So got my associates. That was like a really big moment for me. After that, I kind of tried to put the associates towards some different, uh, different jobs. Um, I got out of Walmart and had some, a, a string of kind of failed attempts at better jobs, uh, that I won't get into here because of some, uh, I don't want to be too public. I'm trying to kind of, you know, hit the, yeah. hit the main points, but not share too much about myself um, on the internet around a bunch of people on a podcast. Um, and so there's a bunch of things that were like maybe, you know, six to eight months at a time. Um, and then I'd find something else. So basically I had a resume full of like Walmart for like four years <laughs> and then a string of jobs. One where I was actually, you know, fired from, which never looks good on a resume. Um, so, yeah, then uh, I, for a while, I was working two jobs where one was actually like uh, mornings and the other was nights alternating. So basically, I would go from about four to four to one p or four to one a.m. like four p.m. to one a.m. on one day, and then have to wake up and do my other job from like nine to about you know three to five depending on how much work i had to do that day um and then i would have basically from like 5 p.m until like you know 3 30 the next day free um so it was this really bad schedule of like never sleeping one day and then like sleeping way too much the next day and like i wasn't eating well like i gained a lot of weight i got really unhealthy you know all this stuff like uh again really low point but i was content um but not like like emotionally content um, but this was like the first thing I had gotten after being unemployed for like six months. So I was like, whatever, I can't, like, I have to have this. Like I had, you know, wiped out all my savings and everything like that. Like it was, a, it was a mess. So I was like, I'm happy to have this. It's fine. Um, so finally I got what I have now. I was like, I can't do this anymore. Like it's ruining my body. I felt tired all the time. My, like my bones ached, uh, cause one job was like really kind of like, uh, physically demanding. And the other was literally standing in one place in the cold. Um, <laughs> So it's like I would, you know, my muscles get exhausted and then I just stand there like the next day I'd stand there like shivering, like everything tensing up. And it was just a terrible combination. I was like eating like grocery store food every day, like, you know, super processed, like frozen stuff. Um, and so I kind of had a, a moment of clarity where it's like, I'm not going to be unemployed, but I have to find something else. Um, so now I'm like, you know, in a, in a somewhat better position. I'm still not making a lot of money, but like it's been stable, like full-time you know like eight to four every day while i'm finishing up school and i'm you know i'm 28 for those that don't know and uh you know getting married in three months graduating in four um and like you know getting close to my 30s like my my era of the 20s has happened like i've you know i've had the highs i've had the lows i've had you know the success the failure like essentially the the epitome of what the what the age of 20 should be um but honestly, like, I still have no idea what I want to do next. <laughs> um, yeah. And so kind of what this whole long, like, what, 10 minute story, sorry, um, <laughs> was basically to say that, like, your 20s are when you're supposed to find yourself. Like, whether that yeah. means, you know, find yourself emotionally, find yourself, you know, sexually, find yourself, like, uh, like, em employmently, what, what is that? what would that be? Uh, I guess financially, sure. Creatively, whatever the case is. Um, because, like, in that time, yes, like I went from, you know, really wanting to do theater to, you know, losing like a, a show that I was really excited for and kind of like losing all my momentum for theater to starting YouTube and like not getting huge, but like, you know, meeting you people and like having a really good like friend group that like 
some of them I've met personally and have, you know, enriched my life. And, um, you know, like Thomas asked if we wanted to start this, you know, charge shot endeavor uh, eight months ago. Wow. Time passes um, eight months ago. And now here we are, like actually, you know, doing decently well. Like I'm proud of our progress and the amount of time it's been. Um, you know, I started this show like on top of the games cast. Like it's all it's all happened like relatively quickly. And I feel like I'm starting to figure it out. Like, um, it's, it's kind of funny. My, I was talking about how I just signed up for my last class of undergrad and how I'm like, you know, super scared of it because of my capstone. And it's this huge, like eight week long project that I'm not ready for at all. Um, especially when it ends like just in time to get married. Um, so I'm going to be planning a wedding while doing all that. Um, and my cousin who just turned 16, um, uh, like posted on, said something on Facebook, like, uh, so what do you want to be when you grow up? And it kind of took me off guard because, you know, she's 16. Like, she's thinking about college and stuff like that. And I'm 28. Just like, welp. <laughs> and I responded. I'm like, I'll let you know when I grow up. <laughs> like, the the point is I've grown a lot as a person. Like, I know who I am. Like, I feel comfortable in my body. I feel comfortable in my mind for the most part. Like, I feel comfortable in my life. Like, I've made a good life for myself. Um, but I still have no idea what I want to do as far as a career. Um, I've been working, you know, like a, a temp desk job for the past eight months just to get through school and everything. When I get my degree, I'll figure that out. I'm still in my twenties. Um, but I kind of just wanted to like, you know, relate to people like the audience, you know, let us know like how your twenties have went. Um, if you're okay with that, if you're in your twenties, you know, like some of the, some of the moments you've had so far, like that make you realize, like, you know, if you feel defeated, it's like, I'm still in my twenties. I have time to figure this out. If you're in your thirties and still haven't figured it out. It's okay. The twenties are a loose decade. <laughs> um, <laughs> 30 is the new 20. Yeah, exactly. Like my, my brother is 31 and he's way more successful than I am, but you know, he's, he went through some stuff too. Um, but yeah, I just, I feel like this is something that a lot of people struggle with like that period in their lives where they just don't know what to do. And I just kind of want to like, you know, put that out there and say like, it gets better. Like you do figure it out. Like, you might not do it tomorrow, you might not do it next week, but, like, something always comes around, and it gets better. Um, so I don't know if you guys had anything to share in that way, but that's that's kind of my topic. Like, it's not really a discussion, it's just, like, sharing. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give my bullet points real quick here for, for like, what I've gone through. Because uh, I, I would actually say it's very kind of similar to you in terms of, like, high school life and all wasn't great. I was actually, uh, I, there, I've got two brothers and a sister. Um, I was born first. My brothers were born about four years later. My mom and dad were very religious. They decided to get to homeschool me. Problem is, when you have two babies, as you start homeschooling your first child, then you start paying more attention to them than you are the one you're supposed to be teaching. Mm-hmm. Um, eventually, as my brothers were getting older, they started giving more and more attention to my brothers and less attention to me. So eventually it turned into, here's the teacher's manual, here's the, the, the regular book, uh, do the work, and then look and see if the answers match. If the answers don't match, go back and redo it until the answers match. That was that was my that was how my that was how my schooling was until seventh grade, which then they sent me to a private school, which was advanced. Anyway, I I didn't do well there. I didn't do it well any of the other places they put me. They didn't want to put me in public school because there were some kids in the neighborhood that picked on me, and they went to that school. They would have been in the same grade, and it would have been a living nightmare because they had a lot of friends in that grade. Yeah, um, I had that too. <laughs> and so I remained homeschooled, but I ended up. Because I was I was reliant on myself to do it, and I was in high school, I didn't want to do it. So I didn't want to do my homework. So I'd end up just screwing off, just doing stuff in my room, because I, I had too short of an attention span to sit there and do the homework. I'd get distracted too easy with the things around me, even if I was just sitting in my room. Um, because I was homeschooled, didn't have any interaction with people uh, outside the family, really. Except for people that lived, like, on the street. People that lived on the street were those people I had problems with. <laughs> um... So occasionally some new kid would move into the area and I might have a friend for a little while out of it. But I mean, I I didn't have many friends or anything um, growing up. I I had like a total of like five friends um, in two different groups uh, my entire childhood. Um, That so social interaction is is terrible for me. Mm -hmm. So going to apply for jobs and things like that. My confidence is garbage because I'm talking to somebody I don't know, first of all. Yeah. Um, among other things, and I've got problems with my family, with some some of my family because of uh, the way I was treated, because of different things. I'm not going to go into all the details. 
some really stupid stuff that I shouldn't have had to deal with, and they admit it now. Um, but when I hit, when I started working, I started, I was kind of isolated from my family. I, I was not <laughs> hardly around my family. And I've dealt with depression since I was about seven, eight years old because of the feeling like I was responsible for all of like being, you know, I was kind of like isolated from my family and all that mm -hmm. stuff, even though I was there with my family. I felt like I had no friends and I felt like I was isolated. Um, when I started working, I think started changing a little bit because I was more reliant on myself. I was buying myself clothes. I was buying this, buying that. My family was there for me, but I, because of my depression that I had kind of developed when I was younger, I didn't really see it when I became an adult, how much they were helping me and how much they were there for me. Um, then eventually when I met my wife, things got even better a little bit. Um, then starting YouTube, I kind of gained some more confidence in myself and I started learning more, um, and, and meeting new people and having new conversations about things I didn't previously think about, um, and continuing to work up where I work and things like that. And so like all these different things that have kind of pieced together. And eventually, like you said, you find your way, you find, yeah. you find different inspirations. Like I had no idea what I wanted to do. My parents had a college, <laughs> a college fund for me to go to college. I mean, it was only like you know, $5,000, but it would have been something. something to go somewhere, but I had yeah. no idea what I wanted to do. All I knew was I kind, I liked watching MMA and I was strong and, and resilient for my age. Not so much now. It, a lot of that's gone. Um, <laughs> um, the, uh, I, I had a extreme interest in movies and TV because I watched a, like Abbott and Costello are my favorite, are my favorite, um, Comedy movies, my favorite movies of all time. Ivan Costello, black and black and white slapstick, basically. But uh, there was a lot of really interesting wordplay. Marx Brothers, also very good. Um, and I, I watch a lot of older stuff, <laughs> so a lot of the newer stuff I, I can't stand most of Seth Rogen stuff. Um, but I, I kind of took a lot of inspiration from watching all these older things because all the people that were around me that weren't my brothers, because my brothers were only a year apart, so they they hung out together. I was on the outside of that group. They, I would, didn't really get along with them because they had them. They had each other, and I was just kind of some other person that lives there. So I spent more time talking to adults. So my vocabulary and everything was high, but I wasn't getting taught, so I did, didn't go anywhere. Um, but I had all this interest in watching movies and stuff because that was I didn't have friends, so I'd sit there and watch TV and movies, and and that's that's kind of one of the reasons like I started doing YouTube is because I saw all these people that were doing things and they were meeting people, and I thought maybe that's how I could make friends. And I mean, I, I hope at some point I can find, um, I can, I can afford to get some training in Photoshop or something and, and make a career out of something that I enjoy doing now, whether or not I, I get that opportunity or not. I'm 27 now. I turn 28 in less than six months. Um, so I feel time closing in on me a little bit, but I know I have time. Um, my wife's pregnant. She's going to be having a baby in February. Um, Thank you. Um, <laughs> and I don't know if I've actually congratulated you on your um, on your upcoming wedding. Um, so congratulations on that as well. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the 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 um, the last I'd say I'd say the last probably seven years have been very rough. And it was only last year that things started to really just click. Mm -hmm. um, I remember that car accident. I think you, you probably remember seeing the picture yeah. of the car accident. Um, it was kind of right around then that things changed because like, I don't know. I, I don't remember. It's not like I, my whole outlook changed because of the car accident, but it's just a coincidence that that kind of created this snowball effect of where, you know, after dealing with all the crap we dealt with through that and all the crap I've dealt with before that, there's not really much. And then, and then there was issues with my wife as we, as a lot of, you know, my friends and all yeah. know, um, and we, we resolved those issues. And not only that, we're, we're, we're stronger now than we've ever been. And it, but you had almost to have that. anything that happens. Yeah. Almost anything that happens, you can overcome. It's a matter mm -hmm. of being resilient and, and finding the right mindset. Um, you, it, and, and the other thing is you, you always need to find out something to help relieve stress. Mm -hmm. And just try not to make that drugs or an underground fight club. There you go. That too. Yeah, that too. Because those are usually... You know, I don't appreciate both of you pointing out my addictions. That's just... <laughs> hey, everyone has their vices. No no judgment. Um, but no, you you kind of made a really good point. Like, it seems like when people are at their lowest, like, that's when you, you know, have to, for lack of a better phrase, not up or shut up. Like, 
Yeah. Um, like it I just said, clicks. you know, yeah, my, uh, my play being canceled was kind of like when I decided, okay, like there's nothing else here for me. Like the theater doesn't want me anymore. Um, you know, I'm not here for school. Like, uh, everything that I like was hanging around here for, cause I stayed in that city for like two years after I was no longer in school and there's nothing else there. It's literally just a college town. Um, so I was like, why am I still here? And like, you know, I figured being closer to family would be a nice, you know, comfort in my, in my dark times and everything. And then like I said, you know, four months later, I'd meet the love of my life. Like that, that's what it took. I just had to leave and like start over and then everything got better from then on. Yeah. There was still some rough parts after that. Um, but like, that was the start I needed to, you know, actually start to feel better. Um, sorry if the cat's distracting. She was being needy, um, <laughs> but uh only video watchers understand um but yeah so i think that is a a key thing is like at your worst i think is when you really find yourself because when everything's going well you don't think about it like that's why i think no one should really know what they want from their lives in their early 20s because it's so easy for most people around then like when i was still in college i didn't think about how poorly i was doing i was out there you know like theater parties hanging out and you know, trying to get to know people that didn't really care about me. Um, and I didn't know it at the time because I wasn't looking, you know, objectively at, at things. Um, but like looking back, I was like, that wasn't me. That was never me. I was trying to be that person, which again, my I'm not, not to continue the devil's advocate thing, but that's what happens with a lot of these, you know, popular young people is like, they are just, they're trying to be who they think people want them to be. Um, and that's true of anyone in their 20s. Um, so I think you need that time to kind of be reckless and free, uh, not necessarily blowing, you know, three years of an expensive education on it. Like I did, um, because I have a lot of debt now and my mom still had to finish paying for my school for me cause I maxed it out. So now like I have, you know, so much debt from an education I didn't actually get, but whatever, besides the point, um, like you have to have that time to yourself to figure things out. Um, I was talking to our friend, uh, Hybrid Havoc, and he was saying that he thinks that, well, he specifically thinks that everyone should go from high school to uh, the military before they go to school because, like, you know, then you get out and they pay for your military. I don't think that's true necessarily, but I don't really understand why there's such a push from going straight from high school to college. I get that education is a very lucrative business, but... I don't think 18 year olds are ready for the next level of education. I mean, I get, I, I think the um, mentality, maybe community college, like to get the associates, but I don't think you should straight like go into a four year, you know, then some people do even more with like, they're uh, immediately going into a master's program and everything. By the time they're 26, they're, you know, they have a doctorate and they're in a hospital. Like that's insane to me. I, I know a lot of people's concern with that is uh, because like, currently there's not like the, like the idea of the gap year. Um, and the idea of going to a community college and then transferring to a bigger school once you know what you want to do. Those are two concepts that have kind of come up in the last, what, 10 years maybe? Um, yeah. And a lot, of the, a lot of the parents that are paying for their kids' schools that went to college, like you know, lawyers and, and doctors and all, they're like, oh, well, that's not how I did it. That's not how you do it. Um, a lot of, that's, that's a decent portion of it, I think. And... and in all reality, the, the, another issue is, you know, the concern that, you know, the, the kids out of high school, they're going to see it as like, oh, I've got complete and total freedom now. And then, you know, the, what happens if they, they aren't paying attention and they lose, they lose track? And then it, it, it it's easier for a parent to think that they can um, guide their, their child directly into college um, than if they let them take a year and then try and get them motivated again. If they're already motivated enough to participate in high school, it's easier in their frame of mind, I would imagine, to try and mean it's easier to keep them motivated enough to go to college right away instead of, you know, taking a year. So and it's it's almost like a, la- a lack of trust in um, the child's uh, ability to recognize their responsibility now. Yeah. But also, like... I feel like that's a, you know, that's a, a thing from a bygone era. Mm-hmm. Like, my mom isn't even that old. Like, um, she, you know, well, I won't say her age, but uh, she, she's barely in her 50s and has, you know, a 31-year-old son. Like, 
she was a, a young parent basically and you know in her case like she was going to go to college out of school and she did technically go two years tech school but uh you know she like got married at 18 had two kids by 25 and was divorced by 28 like that was her path and you know she always says like if she could go back she would get it, she would have done it differently but would still want to have us and you know you can't have it both ways yeah. but I'm just saying, like, now people don't do that, really. Like, there are still the, right. you know, traditional families. Like I said, I knew some people from my high school that were already married and had kids by, you know, my age. But for the most part, you know, they say, like, again, millennials are killing the family unit um, because, like, people prefer to, you know, like, have, like, their jobs and be, you know, have have pets instead of kids and, you know, get a house before they do all that stuff. Like, a lot of... I think our parents' generation was necessity. You know, you you get married out of high school to your high school sweetheart. You both have jobs. You start a family. You get a house. Like, all of it's in that order. Now, I think a lot of times it's like you maybe get married. Then you probably rent for a while. Maybe eventually get a house if you can. Um, But, like, kids are are not a, a necessity. Like, you just live your life the way you want. And it's a lot more free because we're all on the internet. We all talk to each other and talk, say, hey, it's okay to be different. And so now there's a lot more of that. Like, you know, early 20s are about finding yourself rather than settling down and then figuring out that you're not the person that you were when you got married and then like having to start over. So I think you should spend your 20s like failing. <laughs> I hate how that sounds, but, yeah. you know, f- like do things wrong. Like have fun. Just don't, you know, don't settle. That's kind of my pitch. Yeah, I mean, I, I I agree with that. I agree with that. The only thing is, uh, the only thing I I, I would, oh, crap, I can't remember what it was. Forget it. I <laughs> I would agree pretty much with everything you just said. Ben, I know you don't like to talk about your you know your life, but do you have anything to share with us? Um, other than that, I would only I would still say that I, I'm so lost. Like, I would. Sorry, I don't want to get too personal. No, I know. I would say only within the past year and a half have I sort of formulated on what I want to do. Okay. Um, slowly. And that is, you know, it's going to sound stupid and childish, but it's create content. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. And create stuff that people enjoy. I've been doing a Marvel podcast since 2010. I've been, and of course, I've been doing um, other, other, a whole bunch of other stuff, movie commentaries, other podcasts of the people. I just started the YouTube thing about a year and three months ago. And, of course, I just celebrated my one-year anniversary of writing, being, for the first time in my life, being a paid writer for a website. Woo-hoo. A bit not much, and I won't get into that, but it's enough for me on a week-to-week basis. And I just celebrated my one-year anniversary. And, and it's I a look resume at builder. And, it's, it's paid and, work. You can put it on a resume. And, and then I just joined you guys. And I yeah. look at where I'm at. I look at all the stuff I'm producing, and I'm – yeah, I'm still at Walmart. I'm not ashamed to admit that. I'm in a much better place than I was at Walmart. It's still not the greatest, but it allows me to keep my house, so I'm not going to complain that much. And you can um, afford your Amiibo obsession. I don't have an Amiibo obsession. I've, I've, <laughs> my collection is complete. Um, but <laughs> I feel like only now am I sort of comfortable mm-hmm. um, in who I am. But even then, like in Zero, you know more so than you and uh, the Charge Shot people know that. Like, there are days when it's just like I let things get to me, yeah, and that I don't <laughs> like I, <laughs> like I I let the world eat me for all intents and purposes. Like I, once w- once the uh, once the first raindrop hits, it's a flood storm. After that, um, for me, and it's a problem, and it, it affects my work, and it's something I need to work on. But I still feel. At the end of the day, when I start, like when I was recording Freedom Planet this week, and I was just having fun being a goofball, just doing a dumb Let's Play video. I was having fun doing it. And, like, as, you know, I'm 27, just to, to, clarify, to clarify, I'm in the mm-hmm. latter half of my 20s. Yeah. Like, you know, um, it was worse. Like, I would say between 22 to 24 is when I was just like, I'm going to be pretty blunt right here. I'm going to say I was pretty suicidal for those three years. Mm -hmm. Um, Even with creating the podcast and everything, I was in a bad place mentally. 
uh it wasn't it wasn't a good time for me but and, and i won't lie i still have those thoughts every now and then like there there's something that i that are just, that are there and then i do everything i can to fight them back but it's just like you can't i can't help but like one thing goes wrong and then my mind just sort of twists and twists and twists and twists and twists until ultimately i'm just a, a rag doll who just doesn't want to do anything mm-hmm. uh but then I, I wake up the next day here still here and I look at Nerdcore, which is the website I write by. Go visit if you want, please. Mm-hmm. Um, I look at the Charge Shop podcast that we have proudly done for 13 weeks now, or rather 12 because we skipped a week. Um, I look at no it'd the be 13, but we skip. This would be 14 if we hadn't skipped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I look at <laughs> you know Chart Chart Shot, which I've joined recently. I look at the Mighty Warriors Stream Marvel podcast, which I do, which I do by which I do by weekly. We're almost to three, almost to 400 episodes. I look at the movie commentary that I did consec that me and my friend, my best friend, Mr. Dragon, did consecutively for two years. Full movie commentaries consecutively for two years. And I look at the reviews I do for the com. I look at all the stuff that I've done and I'm thinking, I'm doing it. Mm-hmm. Am I getting paid a lot for it? No. But I'm doing it. I'm yeah. doing something that a lot of people say, you know, I'm going to do this, this, and this, and they never do it. And I'm not gonna lie, there are days where I'm say I'm gonna I'm gonna write this today, and I just don't because my brain doesn't want me to write it, or I just yeah. get lazy, and it's a habit I need to fix. But when I do do it, and I look, I take back, and I look, and I'm like, look at how much I've created, look at how much I've done, um, and it's only now am I starting to be okay with, uh, who I am. Like I said, and that's why I've started calling myself the self proclaimed marvelous one, and started being okay with being known as because when i just marvelous it was just a stupid twitter handle that i would have for twitter it wasn't anything it wasn't a persona it wasn't anything like that now it's sort of like not another identity it's just more of like an exaggerated version of myself i guess but i and i I agree with both of y'all said that we need you and like as a person and to make it a little gamey you know or sports for sports for us you need to learn how to lose before you can win yeah Mm -hmm. you you need to learn yo it's like the Dallas character. Cowboys, yeah, exactly. The Dallas Cowboys last year, any football fans out there, were the best team in the NFL all last season. Ugh. They were, I think, they were fifteen and one. <laughs> they got to the end. Of, they got to the final game before the Super Bowl, the biggest game of the year, um, and they lost. No, they lost to the s- second last game, but whatever. They lost is my point. And they're a young kid. They're basically a young team. And and the thing I said was like, like they had to lose before you win. And that's and, and that's the thing I'll say. To echo your you guys' sentiments is that you have to lose in order to understand how to win. Losing mm-hmm. is just as important as winning. Oh, and yeah. you and it, it it sucks. Losing sucks. Believe me, it's awful. It doesn't make you feel good. But if you take from that loss, eventually that loss is going to turn into a W for you, and to lead to something you want to do for the rest of your life. Plus, yeah. you can't appreciate a win if you don't know what the opposite feels like. Right. There's no comparison there. Yeah. I, I would even say, like, last year, last year, this time was actually the worst time in all 27 years of my life. Um, but once once we worked things out, um, the last last 12 months, I, or the last 11 months, have been probably <laughs> some of the best of the last... Um, 10 12 years at least yeah um because it was so bad um and now i understand what from what was going on it's it's put a new perspective on what's actually bad versus what's what i think is bad um because there's always something that could be worse there's always something worse out there that you're not dealing with and uh yeah it's it's it kind of helps you really realize it kind of helps put things in perspective for you when you when you actually deal with something worse than you've ever dealt with before and you come th- come out of it um you there's there's a certain amount of empowerment there's a certain amount of strength that you feel and a certain drive to just never go back to being as um susceptible i guess to to life as um you were before yeah that's what makes you appreciate those moments again and yeah, just kind of one one final note because I feel like we've actually had a really good talk here. Um, 
I, I it went in places I didn't expect it to. Um, I love you guys. But, <laughs> uh, but I, I do want to clear up, like when I say to uh, to just go out there and like you know do things, like have fun, you know, fail, whatever the case is. Like I'm not saying to like you know go do all the drugs and like you know bone all the people like do we like, at try different do not things. encourage drug use yeah exactly <laughs> need a disclaimer um, like try different things like i said like in high school i you know i had a digital production class like i had kind of dabbled with stuff before then i got like a video camera when i was like 13 um and just like you know played around with the little like mini dv tapes and just like hey i can film this and like edit it in windows movie maker whatever but that was like the first time i actually like learned how it all works like how you can make something in photoshop and like you know cut together like sound and video and effects and you know uh transitions and stuff and premiere and like create like this really cool like multi-layered animation and after effects like that's when i learned that you can do this stuff like even at our level not you know it doesn't have to be some hollywood thing um and that changed me like after that i i like i said that was kind of when i realized like this is what i want to do and that was in high school and i spent a while like trying to do it in different forms and it wasn't until I started the YouTube stuff, like after everything else had failed, you know, like I didn't do theater. And then when I got down here, I just didn't know the the community or anything anymore. So I didn't get into it and like work schedule, you know, all those excuses that people have for not getting back into what they used to do. Um, but like, you know, again, Brooke like was was very supportive and was like, you know, if you're feeling depressed and like this creative outlet would help you be better, do it. Like I support your decision, you know, even if it's going to take a lot of time. Like, I'm here for you to, you know, to do what what you're passionate about, because that makes me happy, too. And, you know, again, that's why I'm marrying her. But um, but there's that, you know, that idea of, like, do what makes you happy, but make sure it's something that, like, could benefit you. Because now, like, sure, I've, I have, you know, I haven't made a huge audience on YouTube. But, like, again, you know, the, the whole charge shot thing, like, we're still growing, like, we're working on all this. It's a work in progress. Um, but I've learned a lot of things from just the, like the thumbnails I make for these episodes. Like I try new things every week to make them funny and, you know, dumb and creative and, um, you know, eye catching, uh, that's graphic design, um, cutting together game footage and putting like, you know, goofy things over them. Like that's video production. Like even at the simplest level, if you do anything to your videos, it's not just like, you know, cut, start, cut, end, export. Like, that's video production. Mm -hmm. The basics are, you know, you could probably do better. But, like, you know, even just kind of throwing in some keyframes and, you know, doing some slight animation stuff. Like, all of that is valuable stuff. And so, like, I could put that on a resume. And if I went in to a job that said, like, you know, two years of video editing experience, I could be like, I have that. And they could ask, what you know, what it is. For one, I worked for a... Uh, a news studio at my at the college I used to go to uh, for like six months. So I have that on my resume because it was paid. I was a reporter, you know, I was paid by the packet um, and a camera operator for the live show. Like that is actual, you know, professional experience. Um, I could inflate that if I wanted to lie because, you know, obviously that looks better than YouTube does. But also like I have, you know, like on field experience that technically I'm paid for because we do get paid for YouTube, even if the algorithm algorithms suck now and we don't get anything. Um, yeah, there is still the fact that it is paid experience. Um, and I could make a video reel out of stuff I've made before. Um, my mom's boyfriend has a, has his own business, like doing commercial real estate. And he's like, you know, if I, I've been thinking about doing a commercial and I'd love to get you to do it for me. And so like, I've been, you know, thinking about that. I have a paid community commercial already on my, under my belt. Unfortunately, I don't own it because the business owns it. So I can't actually put it on anything. That's another discussion for another day, intellectual properties. Um, but, like, that's the idea. It's like, you know, you can do piddly little things as you go. Like, whatever you want to dabble in. But make sure it's, like, something that, you know, benefits you, enriches you. It doesn't, like, you know, hurt you uh, or your, you know, your image. Don't Jake Paul it. You know, don't put something out there that you'll regret later um, to tie it all back around. So... Yeah, when I, you know, when I get my degree and I start looking for jobs, I could realistically go for some entry level video production jobs um, because I know graphic design. I know animation a little bit. Um, 
you know, I know video editing, like all that stuff. And I've never worked a video production job before, except, you know, the college news station, which is technically paid work. Um, so the experiences you, you get along the way, even if they're unpaid, even if it's just, you know, exposure, as they say in the business, it's all useful somehow. If you, if you can spin it in a useful way. Um, so that's kind of where I say you need to find yourself. Not, not necessarily because you should go out and party and, and do whatever, squander your twenties. It's because like, that's the time when you should figure out what you're good at, what you should do next, you know, uh, what your strengths and weaknesses are and how to combat those things. Um, who you want to be for the rest of your life, basically. And I'm still working on that. We all are. That's why I wanted this topic. So we're not professionals. We're not experts. But we are people in Speak our later 20s. Speak for yourself. <laughs> Sorry, Marvelous One. Um, <laughs> me and Jake are not experts. But we are people in our late eight, late 20s that have been through all of this stuff that, you know, probably some people listening have already been through. So, you know, or everyone has now. their own story. Yeah, exactly. Everyone has their own story. And the the way you tell it will be important for your future. Um, so just a little, you know, a little bit of words of wisdom. Um, we are going to move into the news now, probably real quick, because there's not a lot to talk about. I'm going to start putting the news at the end, because I feel like it, it benefits the discussions better, because they can just kind of flow into each other, rather than being cut off by news. And you can end um, on a high note. Yeah, exactly. Because this was, it was enlightening, but a little bit depressing. <laughs> yeah. So... Yeah, we'll switch over to the news now. All right. So uh, first up, we've got the uh, Star Wars Episode Nine uh, is apparently getting a complete rewrite um, from Jack Thorne, who I've never actually heard of. Um, but yeah, the the original script was written by director Colin Trevorrow and Derek Connolly, who's his longtime writing partner. Um and I would assume the rewrites come because, uh, you know, the whole um, Carrie Fisher dying thing. And I'm curious how that's going to affect things because they did not redo anything in episode eight. Um, you know, she had finished her recording for that. They didn't want to cut anything or like change anything or digitally alter her or anything like that. But how like how they're going to kind of like rewrite episode nine to not include her, but still probably pay homage to her is going to be interesting. And I'm really curious about that. But I'm glad they're not just like, you know, taking that script and trying to like modify it and like cut her out of it because that would seem awkward. Um, so I think this will be good news, but it's still a little, it's still a little bittersweet to me. It's uh, still really early too. I mean, the, the episode eight hasn't even come out yet. So there's plenty of time for where it's not like they're pushing their luck on getting a new writer or something. Right. And that that's true, but I'm just saying, like, the idea of having to rewrite it, like, for such a tragic reason is still sad, but it's yeah. going to benefit the movie overall. Um, it's just yeah, sad hopefully. to think about. Yeah, it'd be a shame if they were, if they were, uh, if it was to hurt the movie plus losing Carrie Fisher. Yeah. Then I mean, it's probably going to hurt the that. movie because they're going to have to write around that no matter what. It's not going to be easy. Yeah, that's true. But, yeah, oh well. Um, and then moving on, which, like I said, we're going to touch on a lot of this stuff pretty quickly. Um, moving on, uh, the Dark Universe is apparently in trouble, for you know, mm. better or worse. Um, because Alex mm-hmm. Kurtzman, who's kind of like the, you know, the head of this whole thing and was also the director of The Mummy, um, has announced that he's not really sure if he plans to continue being involved with it. <laughs> um, Basically, he you know wasn't super impressed with the uh, with the performance of the Mummy, even though it apparently did really well overseas. Um, and he said that quote, uh, "I have to stay interested in it. I have to feel like my passion is there for it." Um, so it makes it sound like he wasn't too thrilled, and that he probably wasn't really that excited about a huge universe in the first place. So the poor box office numbers have left him a little bit uh, dispassionate. <laughs> towards the whole thing which is kind of what people were, were thinking it just looked like mission and bandages yeah it did um but i feel like a lot of people were expecting this after the mummy didn't do well probably even before the mummy came out they were expecting this we talked about it briefly but yeah they yeah. announced this whole thing too early and now they're probably pushing it all on him and i'd want to quit too <laughs> yeah he is uh he does he is still doing the uh the new star trek movie or star trek show coming up so hmm. I think that's kind of what he's focused on right now. And like, that's actually, you know, quoting really well so far, as far as like, uh, 
viewer interest and like critical reception and stuff like that. Uh, so I'm sure he's a lot more excited about the future of that series than the future of this dumb dark universe. No, it's not dumb. <laughs> it's, it's pretty not dumb. dumb. It's they not made dumb. Tom Cruise a big part of it. That was a dumb move. Yeah, Tom Cruise is a movie star. Yeah, but why is he in the so movie? So is Nicolas Cage. What's your point? Who is he? <laughs> He's random soldier guy number forty five. Uh huh. <laughs> just saying. I just Brendan I just, Fraser did I it just, I just want. I'm I'm literally crying right now. I just want to see monsters, because monsters aren't a thing anymore. And every time I hear negative news, I know Zero is cackling in the background at my expense, and it's not okay. It is not okay. No. To be clear, I'm I'm so on board with more like monster movies, but they don't need to be in a shared universe. That's so dumb. Are they gonna make? Okay, yeah. before I before I make this reference, I wanted to be clear that I actually really enjoy the movie Leave Extraordinary Gentlemen, even though I know it's terrible. But are they going to make another like Leave Extraordinary Gentlemen movie? Because that did so well. <laughs> even even Van Helsing. I know it kind of hurt that joke by saying I liked it, but whatever. I'm willing to die on that sword. Didn't Van Helsing have? Um, I think it started off with him fighting. Um, Doctor Jekyll, uh, Mister Hyde. Yeah, 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 and then and then it went on to the to the Dracula later on in the movie. The and only I mean, one it didn't really have was the Mummy itself. It pretty much had every classic Universal monster. Well, mm-hmm. and the um, Invisible Man or the yeah. uh, the fish. I mean, monster. it might have had the Invisible Man. <laughs> That's, no, I mean, I the Invisible have... Man's every scene. I don't know what they were trying, what they're trying to build to with that, with this this movie universe, with the Dark Universe. But I almost feel like I would have rather see something more like that, more like. Um, Van you know, again. more more about Van Helsing taking them down, or so, not necessarily yeah. Van Helsing, but something more like that, which I think is what they were trying to do. But they kind of made. I didn't see the movie, but they definitely looked like they were kind of. There was something sinister about Russell Crowe, who was leading what was like. He's Doctor Jekyll. Oh yeah, yeah. I forgot. I, I did yeah. hear somebody say that. But, um, but the issue is they should have started with, if they want to make a shared universe, start with Van Helsing. He's already the glue between all of the other monsters. I would have rather just see Van Helsing or, or something something along those lines where rather than trying to come up with some super complicated thing and then implant it into a modern day and still make it about old school monsters, I, I would rather actually see it as a period thing. Agreed. Yeah, that, I hope we never have to talk about that that universe again, because um, <laughs> it'll just go away. But also, speaking of other things that nobody wants, um, Suicide Squad Two has lost its director again. <laughs> you like that, that segue? <laughs> um, oh, perfect. So after David Ayer decided not to come back for the Suicide Squad sequel, um, I believe they had they were you know trying they were shooting around between different. Um, different directors. There was possible of, of Mel Gibson and a few others, and it came down to uh, uh, John Collette Sarah. I don't know how to say that name, but I think that's right. Uh, who did The Shallows? And he came in to direct the movie. But now, before it's even started, as far as I know, uh, he's dropped out. Um, also, uh, this is saying that the subtitle for the sequel was Suicide Squad: Hell to Pay. That's an yeah, awful title. That. Uh huh. Yeah, all right. I, I gotta um, wonder who's villain, what villain that is. I can't believe Mel Gibson. That's weird. Yeah, that would have been like a good fit at all. But yeah, so there's really no information on this. Um, DC's been losing directors left and right, which is not good. Mm-hmm. But uh, I guess they were trying to get it, like get it shooting soon. Um, but even Joel Kinnaman, like one of the main stars, doesn't know. He said, as far as I know, they're writing the script, and I think the plan is to shoot it sometime in 2018, but that could change. So, like, it's such a mess. The, uh, not only that, isn't, uh, isn't Jared Leto, like, done with DC? So now they have to find a new Joker, too, wouldn't they? Allegedly. Unless he's just not going to be involved? Well, he wasn't happy with how he was, you know, portrayed in Suicide Squad. Right. But there's also rumors they're doing a Harley and uh, Joker spinoff movie. Um, which, oh, I didn't heard he was going to be involved with it. I heard it was just supposed to be a Harley movie. I mean, there is the Har- there's the a, uh, Gotham City Sirens movie, but there's also allegedly a Harley and Joker spinoff movie that's like, okay. you know, like their origin probably leading into like a, a little fun off- side off adventure with them. But I personally think that like Suicide Squad worked best as, well, not much, but 
Um, it worked best as a way to introduce these characters. Like, we don't need more of the Suicide Squad. The char- there are some good characters in it. They can be pushed off. Like, the you know, I think the Gotham, Gotham City Sirens movie could actually be good. Um, and Harley was one of the best parts of Suicide Squad. They could bring, you know, Deadshot into, like, the like the Batman movie. Have him be a villain in the Batman movie or something. Um, or I mean, they have already them... have Deathstroke, so... Well, I mean, they're rewriting the script, so we, they don't know if Deathstroke's still going to be in it. It would have been cool but... to see Deathstroke versus, um, versus Deadshot with Batman kind of caught in the middle. Right, I was going to say, like, they could even, you know, continue the thread of Deadshot not necessarily being a bad guy, but just, like, you know, fighting for whoever gives him money. So, like... You know, Batman could feel overwhelmed by Deathstroke and, like, hire Deadshot to help him so they have a tenuous alliance. Well, Batman would not do that, no. <laughs> or vice versa. Deathstroke hires D- Deadshot to go after Batman. Like That I could see, but Batman would never do that. I'm just saying something that. where, like, he's not the main villain, but, like, he's, like, kind of right, a, right. you know, he's not sure which side he wants to be on type thing. Zero, you have to be realistic when talking about a man who's a billionaire who just is like a bat. I'm sorry. Batman oh, supposedly wouldn't kill anybody either. True. But no, he just maims him. He just maims a motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so DC's in more trouble. That's on top of, you know. No, they're not. Big surprise. Okay. If they lose Suicide Squad 2, they're not going to lose us because Wonder Woman 2 will do great. Justice League is going to do great. It's all great. It's great. It's great. My friend my well, friend Paul said it's going to be great. Yeah, but didn't even Suicide Squad, didn't that make a whole bunch of money even though it sucked? Yeah. No, it, it, yeah, it made a lot of money. It was a the lot top of, grossing people... uh, DC movie until Wonder Woman came out. Because people want to see the characters no matter what. Yeah. And Will Smith will sell a movie, so there's that. Yeah, yeah that too. And I think, a lot, I think a lot of people just like the movie as well, even though it's a bad movie. Yeah, I, I've, I've, I know too many people that I, I know too many people that it actually hurts. I get a headache when I think about. It. I got to stop thinking about it. But I know too many people that actually do like the movie. Yep, there it is. There's the headache. I'm starting, starting to set on. Ugh. Yeah, that's upsetting. Academy we're, we're, Award nominee. Suicide we're moving Squad. on to some some better DC news. Um, on the TV side, where DC is actually succeeding for the most part. Debate up Supergirl. Shots fired. Um. <laughs> Supergirl's not bad. I just said that to make you mad. Uh, they recently announced the uh, the next crossover for next season on all the shows. And it will actually be a full four-part crossover uh, that takes place across two nights. Um, the show's been moved around a little bit as far as when they air. So I believe it's supposed to be... Uh... Yeah, the, the two shows like will be, or the four shows, I guess, will be on Monday and Tuesday, November 27th and 28th, respectively. Um, and it will be Supergirl and Arrow on that Monday, and then Flash and Legends of Tomorrow on that Tuesday. Um, but how they actually air will be, like, for the season, uh, Mondays will be Supergirl, uh, Tuesdays will be Flash and Legends of Tomorrow, and then Thursdays will be Arrow. So they're just moving Arrow for one week to do the crossover which is kind of confusing. Um, And they give a little tease of what it'll be about. They said like each year they try to, you know, have some reason for it to be like this big moment to bring everyone together. And apparently this year is going to be some, uh, a a big personal uh, romantic event, um, which I assume will be Barry and uh, uh, Iris's wedding. But seriously, they need to stop focusing on romance on these shows. Yeah. (laughs) Um, so yeah, they said they're approaching it like two two back to back two hour movies, um. And so like you know, and and that way it's it's not really so much about like what happens in each episode, more like you know each night is an event, um. So that's it will actually be like a full crossover, not the hey here's the tail end of a crossover at the end of Supergirl. Uh, so I'm, that you can just watch Flash for. Yeah, exactly. I'm pretty excited for that. Like that should be pretty epic. Um, and so far, Black Lightning is not part of all that because it's a mid-season show. And at this point, it's not part of the Arrowverse. Uh, I think in another interview, uh, Berlanti said that if the showrunners of that show decide to bring it into the Arrowverse, like if they set it there, then, you know, that's fine. Um, but they are not, you know, making it part of it, like, you know, mand- mandating it. Um, but if it becomes part of the Arrowverse, they'll deal with it when it happens. So it sounds like they don't really care either way. Like they can't control it necessarily. Um, but if it is part of the Arrowverse, they'll figure it out. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of funny. Um, 
And then another little bit that came out um, of the same interview, uh, basically a press tour for this year's seasons of shows. Um, I actually hadn't read this one yet. I found it at the last minute. So bear with me for a second. Um, It's saying that the next season of Legends of Tomorrow uh, will feature a similar kind of Legion of Doom thing. They already announced that uh, Damian Dark and someone else were coming back. I don't remember who. Uh, let's see. Damien Dark. Maybe it's just him. I thought there was someone else. And then Gorilla Grodd is joining the team. Wow. Which doesn't really surprise me because it's it's Legends of Tomorrow. But, like, he's not cheap. <laughs> There's a reason he was only, like, sparingly used in, uh, in Flash. So... Yeah, Legends is ballsy. Like, they got T-Rexes just randomly showing up in episodes. Now they're going to have Gorilla Grodd. You, you know what's probably going to happen is they'll probably ha- he'll probably, um, to save on costs, he'll possess some random human, and that'll be Gorilla Grodd. And you'll only see Gorilla Grodd during points where they absolutely need to show Gorilla Grodd off. I guarantee it. Um, but... So I doubt it's going to... Pretty much, it's gonna be a little bit more than the Flash, but not I get not nearly as much as you'd think, probably. Oh yeah, Rip likely. was the other one that's coming back. That's right. Um, yeah, he kind of went evil. And yeah, I don't back. know if he's gonna be part of the Legion, but like they they had such a good ending for him, it'd be weird. But I think he's just coming back as a recurring guest star. Uh, so I could actually see him being the one that Grodd controls. That could be a good way to bring him back because it's like you know that's someone they already established as like kind of switching sides but has a connection to the Legion, to the legends. So like if, you know, Grodd basically controls him and sends him into the legends, like they wouldn't know that he's being controlled yet. Um, he'd infiltrate, you know, Damien would get all the information he needs. So on. Yeah. So that, that could be a way of doing it. Um, and then this is going to be a post gorilla city Grodd. Um, and it said legends will lean even more into Grodd's sympathetic and sad plight. And at least one of the legends will take the bait for Grodd's side of things. Probably uh, Amaya. <laughs> yeah, she yeah. has that whole connection to animals and whatnot. Um, but they said there will be a bit more uh rotation in the group as far as the heroes and villains. Um, but you know the staples will still be there, and uh, there will be officially a new legend. Um named Zari, I guess. It says uh, it's a new character based on the DC character Isis. They're just not using that name. <laughs> oh, that's uh, Black Adam's wife. Oh, uh, okay. I mean, that's obviously not her. But yeah, but she's... Uh, if I'm thinking of the same character, that was the, she was married to Black Adam. And I don't... I don't remember what her powers were. I don't even know she had some. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. Uh... But yeah, she's going to tie into the story because she is a hacktivist from the year 2042. Um, Never mind, that's definitely not Black Adam's wife. Yeah, probably not. Unless they're just, like, drastic. I mean, it says it's a new character, but I don't know if it means new to the show. Or if they're, like, basically, you know, basing her on another character but having her be entirely new. It's unclear. Um, But I guess this season's going to be dealing with anachronisms, uh, where figures from throughout history appear in time periods not their own. Which actually sounds really fun. (laughs) Yeah, um, can we get FDR in 2017, please? <laughs> That'd be great. Uh, and so she's there to uh, push them to think beyond just fixing them and instead actively improving history. So I could see them like doing some cool team ups and like you know actually messing with things on purpose. So versus the whole mandate of last season, we don't fuck with the time stream. Right. It's basically going to be the opposite of that, and I can't wait. I think this is probably going to be the best show because there's always that you know third season slump that these shows go through. Um, and it sounds like this might be the best season of the of the series so far. Um, and they also say that uh, Wentworth Miller is coming back as a bizarro version of Captain Cold, and that they're still trying to get Matt Ryan's Constantine to appear. Um, oh my god, He yes, is officially part of the CW universe now. Of course he was on Arrow, but he has an animated version of Constantine that's on CW Seed. Um, I don't know if you've seen, seen anything about that. But he is, like, officially part of the universe, like, you know, canonically. Um, and, and currently, so there's no reason they couldn't bring him on. Like Matt Ryan is voicing the character in that animated show. He's like, he's no longer tied into the, what was it? Fox, NBC, something like that. 
NBC had the produced the uh, Constantine show. Yeah, so I could see them actually like having him part. I don't see why it would be a licensing issue anymore. Um, but yeah, so a lot of news for Legends of Tomorrow, and it all sounds pretty fantastic. Uh, moving, moving on to the Marvel side of things, um, they showed the first image of uh, Domino and the Deadpool movie. <laughs> Um, but it's as he beats and there's two things about this one she looks fantastic and two actually like i had just seen the thumbnail before i hadn't pulled it up full size i didn't realize she's like laying on like a a deadpool skin rug <laughs> that's pretty amazing um but yeah there's been a lot of controversy about this because she's not like white skinned um and instead just has basically like a white eye patch um which could still be you know like a skin defect the whole thing is that she has a skin defect from her mutation I doubt that's, like, face paint. It's probably still a skin defect. It's just, you know, like, white on black instead of black on white. I don't see the big deal. She looks fabulous. Kind of looks like, she's, kind of looks like maybe she's, like, covering up where the skin issue is, maybe? Oh, I can see that, too, actually. That would work. Uh, I but I don't know. The, I, I, I have I've the never... uh, original one in print. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> I love this image. <laughs> yeah, it's great. And this is the perfect way to introduce her. But I've never seen the big deal about making characters, like, look authentic. Um, In some cases, I get it. Like, you know, with Mary Jane, like, the the red hair is such a big part of her. I wouldn't want to see, like, a non-redhead Mary Jane. Um, I mean, you did. It was in Spider-Man Homecoming. You saw one. It wasn't Mary Jane. It was MJ. That wasn't Mary Jane. Mary Jane is MJ. That's her. No. It's the same thing. You can't get over it. See? This is the hypocrisy right there. Give me a newspaper. I need to hit him in the nose. (laughs) No. (laughs) I'm just saying, that's Mary Jane. No, it's, it's not. It goes by MJ. Because that's not. They said that they could still bring in Mary Jane. Like, Kevin Feige okay. specifically said that okay. that was just a little tease. There could still okay. be another Mary Jane in the world. They just wanted to have that moment so that that's if they fun. don't bring in Mary Jane, they still have their MJ. But she's not Mary Jane Watson. They okay. said that. If you create your own character, you can do whatever you want. But I'm going to laugh when she's Mary Jane Watson in the sequel. Like, laugh. in this case, well, they, already said her name's Michelle. Like, they made it work. Um, she's not, you know, completely different from the, from how the character is supposed to be. She's thematically similar, but they right. played to the, you know, I the like actress they chose. They played to her strengths. Um, yeah, and I think it looks great. I, like it's a, it's an interesting interpretation. Even in comics, like they change costumes and looks all the time, but people accept it because it's comics. Why is it any different in movies? I don't agree with it. But it's because when you're reading a comic book, it's one thing to change a costume, but you're not changing. For the most part, you're not changing a character's race, and I think, and I don't agree with any of these people. And I'm going to play devil advocate right here, mm-hmm. devil's advocate. But for certain people, when a character gets brought to the big screen, they have to be a certain way. And for Domino, to me, she was just a clown. Like I didn't know anything about the whole as a skin. I thought she was just a clown for the longest yeah. time. Um, but to me, when it was when it was said that was Zazzy Beats, uh, was I? I'm sorry, I know her name, but I can't help but giggle. I know um, it's pretty great. Miss M- Beats is is gonna be Domino. <laughs> I was like, that's not a problem. But a friend of mine is like, well, Domino's not black, so it's like, you know, if that was the case, if we're okay with making Domino, why don't we make Superman uh, Hindi? Why don't we make Batman African American? And why don't we do this and that? And I can and and when you're reading these comic books for most of your life, because most of these people who've been reading their comic books have been reading them since they were you know young kids for teenagers, me included. Um, that when you finally get to the big screen, you have a certain expectation as to what they want to look like, and what they don't look like um, how you how they look like for most of their life. Costumes aside, again, you can always change costumes. People hate costume changes too, by the way. Um, but even then it's like, that's not what I wanted. That's not what I envisioned. They don't care that the character is going to be the same. They don't see what they saw when they first fell in love with the character. A lot of people love Domino. I like Domino. I think she's going to be grind, but I do see the complaint that when people see her on a first look that that's not Domino to me. Mm-hmm. Is it wrong? debatable is it it's racist? a new domino big whoop <laughs> is is it is but not to them it doesn't i know to to certain people it doesn't look like domino and i have to see because i don't think she looks like she didn't look like domino at first until i saw the little eye thing and like i have to see her act 
Yeah. You know, especially for cons- I have to see how she portrays the character. I'm not saying Domino's exclusively deep or anything, but uh, understand where they're coming from. A lot of them are not racist assholes who hate black women uh, that a black woman's playing it. A lot of the fact that it's well, that's not what Domino's look like for years in the comic books, and they want and because you want to see when you want to see something come to your life, you want to see how it's always been done. You want to see that preserved, and when it's not preserved. Sometimes some people can accept it. Sometimes people can't. It's not always because I guarantee you, anybody who's not who's had said anything negative about Miss Beats being Domino have been has been labeled a racist, misogynistic ass. Uh, I mean not misogynistic, but labeled as a racist when it's not true. For the most part, there are probably some assholes out there who don't like the fact that Domino's black. But a lot of us like, well, that's not what she's looked like. That's not what Domino looks like. This is what Domino looks like. And it's not necessarily um, purists. There's just a lot of people that just. It's kind of off-putting to them seeing the character. Exactly. Don't know. Yeah. Exactly. Like seeing like, like to me when I saw Henry Cavill like Superman all buffed up like that, I was like, well, that's not, that's yeah. not Superman. Superman's a lean dude. But, but I, just, I have like, again that two kind of things about this is one, like in the comics, Domino is black and white. Like her, you know, her skin is pasty white and she has black spots. Like this is literally just the reverse of that. It's still black and white. It's just the opposite. It's but and it's two, not. Hold on, hold on. Two, them, it's not because same. she's a black woman, like, if she, if they had, you know, just completely painted her white and put a black spot on her face, people probably would have been pissed because of racism. It's like, how dare they make that black girl white? Like, so the, they probably cut their losses here. Yeah, people are going to be mad regardless, but don't fault somebody who, when they first look at Domino and they don't recognize Domino. I, I mean, I get that. And like, she doesn't look it. like traditional Domino. I'm yeah. just saying, like, this is what they're introducing as the movie's Domino. And I'm okay with it. This isn't the comics Domino. This is the movie's Domino. Right. They're what not I think the same thing. Is it, it points more to me. Uh, the first thing I see when I look at it is the afro and what looks like we're going 70s. And since Cable's there, I'm guessing that means that's where they're going time frame wise. Well, is time travel. Ryan Ryan Reynolds did tweet out a, pic, a picture of I don't know why I said it that way <laughs> of him with so I I don't remember the actor's name it was like and we were at the men's festival in 1956 so you mm. could be right about that yeah they might find her outside of time and that's why she looks like this she might not be a present be, day yeah. per, uh, present day character like I said I'm okay with it but I don't think anybody who just who does not like the look immediately is a racist asshole yeah should be labeled as such I mean first thought I was like what that's ex- not what I expected but then I looked and I was like actually that's really cool yeah and i guarantee you most of them will probably when the movie comes out unless she does horribly because that is a possibility she yeah, can fail that's true that as long as she has this persona of domino then she'll be fine but if she sucks and it's all hell it's gonna break all, then it's like well that was what was the change for right so she has to do a good job that's yeah. true which sucks for her just to make it her own because like, they made justify. it her own yeah. like by changing her appearance mm-hmm yeah. Okay, uh, real quick, you get a minute to talk about the It trailer. I'm not going to play it. I still haven't watched it. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. We all float down here, Zero. We all float down here. I, um, I will say this. Uh, the, original it, the original It television series, because that's what it was, or TV movie, uh, still scars me to this day to where I don't walk past drain pipes anymore or open drains anymore because of fear of clowns. Uh, but watching this new trailer, um, I know a lot of people had a lot of, uh, problems with Bill Skarsgård or I can't remember. I know yeah. it's Skarsgård. Um, yeah, it's Bill. as, as, as Pennywise the clown, by the way, saying his name freaks me out too. <laughs> cause I'm looking to my right. Where the fuck are you? Son of a bitch. Um, uh, Pennywise the clown. Cause Tim Curry did such an iconic job. I know zero never saw it, but like Tim Curry was the face of evil for me as a child and the, and the face of evil for many people. And I think this trailer one captures a lot of what a Stephen King novel should be. It looks a lot. It, it, it looks like there's going to be a lot of clown, but it, I like that it's versus the, the, in the, in the movie, cause I never read the book. I'll be honest with you. The movie basically focuses on the clown. And then as you see the second movie, it points like it's not really a clown. It's more of a man's of fears. And as you see in the trailer, there's different stuff going around, which sort of in, and you see the sort of messed up town of Derry. They they play up the kids' friendship. Um, I can't wait for this movie. Like I was very skeptical, um, but there was one shot that stole me on this, and that was when um, 
they're like it's a quick shot where the kids are talking about a clown and it cuts to Bev and then Bev turns around and you see it you see the clown and it's just and it's like okay that's it I'm, I'm in because it looks creepy it looks unsettling um, by the way if you watch the YouTube comments uh, do me a favor I'm not going to spoil it go watch the trailer I know if you're afraid of clowns it's fine be brave for 2 minutes and 14 seconds put subtitles on watch it to the very end you will laugh I promise uh, but I'm very excited. I'm going to go see this when it comes out. I, I'm scared because I know I'm going to be terrified out of my pants. But I want to see this because it looks fun. And I want to be scared for right before the Halloween season. Uh, real quick. Good job on your time. Um, but real quick. Uh, you said to look at the YouTube comments. And so I scrolled down real quick. I mean, so I'm not going to watch mean... the trailer. No, hold on. And uh, the, the top comment says, I didn't see one computer in this trailer. Are you sure it's about IT? <laughs> <laughs> And there were, there was one somewhere like that where like this movie is a false representation of what I do. I work in IT. This is a fa- movie is a false representation of what I do on a day to day basis. Yeah, I love it. But seriously, it's gonna like I was skeptical, but after seeing it, it's gonna be great. One of the kids from Stranger Things is in it. Um, Finn Wolfhard playing. Say his name because um, it's great. I don't I don't I don't know child actors. I will never know child actors. But his name is Finn um, Wolfhard. <laughs> I don't I don't. Again, I'm being stubborn right now. But yeah, um, go all see right. it. Get over your fear of clowns because nope. he's not real. Go see it. Nope. Come join us. We all float down here. Nope. Zero, I'm going to make you see this with me. How? I'll fly to Kansas or something. I'll buy you a ticket. I'm sure Brooke will want to go. <sighs> I don't live in Kansas. <laughs> I don't. I think he lives in Kansas, people. Um. So Missouri? I have a little... You live in Missouri. That's close. It's right there. <laughs> I mean... It's about three hours, but whatever. Um, I want to have a little bit more time to talk about this. We're already running long. Uh, last story is about Netflix. Um, you put this in here, but I just I find like the business side of things fascinating. So I kind of wanted to go over this real quick. Um, so you know everyone everyone knows Netflix. Netflix is a huge thing. Like they have some of the best shows out there. Um, and you know you think like they're blowing up all over the place, but. Uh, this article basically set, talks about how they could possibly be doomed because they've accumulated $20.54 billion in uh, long and short-term debt just in the past uh, five years, mostly. Yeah. Um, and all of this is from their, you know, their push towards original programming because they get all this from investors to make the shows and they make them and or shows and movies. They make them, put them out there, and hope that will drive up, you know, subscriber counts. Um, because what's interesting about Netflix that you might not really think about, because you know, most like like if you think of Amazon or whatever, they also have original programming, but they're Amazon. Uh, Netflix is entirely subscription based. They have no other way to make money than the subscriptions. So that means that all the money they're putting into things, um. Basically, if that doesn't, like, get them more subscribers, they're not making new money. Sure, they get monthly subscriptions, but they also have, you know, their their office costs, their, you know, their overhead for the people and the uh, servers that they run all their stuff off of. Like, everything like that. That has a cost associated with it, too. And um, currently, they have 104 million subscribers worldwide, uh, which is up 25% from last year. So, like, they are growing pretty substantially um but even with the price increases yeah uh, and that's almost could quadruple from five years ago so if you take that 104 divided by five that's like that would have been like 20 million uh five years ago so basically they've gained approximately you know 80 million in five years but they've garnered 20.4 billion dollars in that same time um because what is it like eight nine dollars a month for netflix i i it comes out automatically i don't pay attention um 9.99 i think now it's eight nine dollars ten depending on what kind of quality of okay. video you want let's go with 10 Plus because you, the, the math they... is easier um <laughs> yeah so that would basically be like you know 104 million times 10 that's 1.4 billion right hashtag zero math I'm so bad at math. You don't understand. Um, but if that's right, that's $1.4 billion they get every year. Or every month, I guess, technically. From the subscribers. 
Um, that would be if it stayed constant, you know, month over month. Um, so every year, that would be basically like four. Let's say twelve to fourteen billion, because you know, twelve months of the year. I'm not going to do that math exact. Um, so in a year, they wouldn't make enough to cover their normal costs plus this debt they've got they've accrued accrued um but they're also that's over five years that's not over one year so basically what i'm trying to say is technically they could probably pay off some of this as they go but they just keep using more debt to finance their shows and stuff instead of the actual money they're bringing in um one thing i wonder is if they've considered and it's highly highly possible i know there's a lot of movie studios that do this when they're preparing for a movie is they'll they'll make sponsorship deals where say you know pepsi trying to fix the problem with their bad PR a few months ago decides to, Hey, we'll give you this much money to help your production of the next season of daredevil. And then when the Marvel splash comes up at the beginning of the show before it starts playing, and then they have a small splash for Pepsi or something like that. And then it goes in without commercial still. That's an awful idea. Can, but yeah, that idea, that that yeah. kind of thing, like subliminal advertising and stuff. I'm sure they do have advertisers the on their shows and things like that. Better option would be to see Matt Murdock just drinking a Pepsi yeah. in his office. No, he opens the fridge yeah. and like it's just Pepsis and he like kind of like reach like f- fumbles around in the fridge, he can't find it. So it's, it's like, just Foggy, why did you buy more Pepsis? Yeah. Cuz Matt Murdock wouldn't drink Pepsi. No. But like the problem is like Netflix puts a lot of money into making these shows. And they also put a lot of money into buying the exclusive rights to different movies and things like that. Like, this mentions uh, the new Will Smith movie, Bright, that was shipped to a bunch of different studios. And Netflix outbought all of the, like, the big name studios, like Paramount and stuff like that, to get the exclusive rights to this movie. So, a, a, <laughs> like, producers did make it. Like, they, you know, Netflix bought the rights to, to stream it, but it was made by a different company and then Netflix owns it, basically. So they didn't put all the money into actually buying it or actually making it as far as I know. Um, I'm sure they helped. Yeah. They were they were one of the producers. But the idea here is that they're putting all of this money up front into all of this content and inclusive streaming and everything like that for all this stuff. Um, and it's really expensive. But year over year, all of this is still going to be there. Like it's a one time investment up front and they're going to keep getting new subscribers. Um, so they basically say that uh, they expect to be free cash flow negative for many years, meaning it will continue to, to bleed cash for the foreseeable future. Um, but over time, um, again, assuming they continue to get new subscribers, because if they don't, they're just going to stagnate and stay at the same cost level, even though their their you know debt goes up. Um, if they continue to get new subscribers, they're not going to be putting as much money into new stuff because they're already going to have such a huge back catalog. Um, and they'll have, you know, all of the rights already paid for and everything. So eventually the, what they're spending is going to even out with the growth to the point where they don't need to spend as much and it, you know, eventually it starts to profit. Um, I don't necessarily see that happening because they just keep spending more money. Like they've got all the Adam Sandler movies coming out that we've talked about before. You know, they've got that bright movie. They've got like a bunch of comedy specials and documentaries and a new Scorsese movie, I guess, that's coming uh, that says it is estimated to have a one hundred million dollar price tag alone just for that. Um, It does say in here that they're part of their plan is to cut down um, their content to like 50 percent generated in company. So I guess part of the way that they're planning on cutting down their cost is by instead of licensing already existing stuff as as much as they already do. Because so, most of their content right now is still licensed from other production companies and right. what have you. So I guess part of, their, part of their plan is to not license for multiple years for so much content and focus more on generating their own content. Yeah, and it did say like they just moved to a 14-story... Uh, building recently yeah. in order to kind of facilitate their growth and so that's something where like theoretically they probably have you know like studio spaces uh, mm-hmm. on different floors that they can use for like you know if they have if they start doing like sitcoms or something they could have like a set just like on one of the floors or like you know that the the ranch the, that dumb show that I don't think is coming back at this point oh, yeah. things like that <laughs> you know that are more <laughs> simple um, don't require like huge sprawling locations 
They could yeah. do a lot of that, like on location in their actual uh, office building or whatever. Um, I'm sure some of it is going to be server farms because that stuff is crazy. Um, so, I mean, they take on a lot of YouTuber stuff lately too. They've been having, yeah. they've got quite a few YouTubers that have had shows. Um, and, and a lot of that stuff that YouTubers know how to work on a very small budget with mm-hmm. a, a, a limited studio workspace. That's why um, they like even those something things. I heard on a podcast recently talking about um, the potential of them getting a, uh, their, their, their group, the sugar pine seven, they were talking oh, about cool. um, potentially having some kind of Netflix program. Did you, do you, are you watch his, um, his series? Yeah. The, like the finale is just a perfect example of the amount of skill that their group has and could mm-hmm. actually take and put into something. Yeah. Um, and like that, that's the kind of thing I think that I think that stuff like that is where they're, where they're looking to like individuals with new ideas or, or at least um, creative takes on something that already exists. And that's, I think they're, they're trying to take, um, I know I saw something recently where they were saying that uh, the Netflix executives we're actually getting uh, on on the people that were buying the rights to things, and mm-hmm. and, and uh, actually the the writers that they have in house, because some of a lot of the stuff they were worried was too sure a thing. They wanted it to be as there's no reason this should work, but it works because we did we picked the right people. That kind of stuff. Like they they were really looking for let's go out there and go where it shouldn't work bring it here, make it work and get, and that's how they draw the attention in because they're like you, so many movies now are just kind of cookie cutter. They have a basic yeah. formula for, for how this type of movie goes, how this type of movie is. Yeah. Happening. Like they're Adam Sandler deal. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, and that's the thing is I think they they were trying to like use that to like, I think they were trying to use him to like lure in other people. Like, look, yeah, we can give you were. a whole bunch of money to come here and make stuff. Yeah. But the, the point is they're doing all this stuff to bring people in. Because they say that uh, this way, you know, they're spending a lot of capital up front, but then you get a payout over many years, which is kind of what I was talking about. Um, Because, like, they make all this stuff and they could have, you know, seasons of it. And then as new subscribers come in, they're going to watch all the old stuff. Like me, for example, I get, you know, HBO now whenever Game of Thrones is on. So, like, right now I've been watching, you know, Game of Thrones every week. But then throughout the week, we're watching, like, Silicon Valley and Westworld. And, like, I watched that new... uh, uh, Crap, I can't remember his name, but the, it's called Crashed uh, from that one comedian guy, uh, Pete something. Um, Pete Holmes. Yeah, Pete Holmes. Thank you. And like I started Vice Principals and like there's all those shows that, you know, came out in the time since like, well, maybe not since last year's Game of Thrones, but, you know, ones that I hadn't really gotten into before, but I've heard about recently. And it's like, yeah, we'll check those out while we've got HBO now. So that's the same thing. It's like, you know, people might only keep Netflix for a few months while they watch like one thing that they like. But they'll go back and watch everything else while they're there. Mm-hmm. So, like, in, there's incentive because it keeps people on. Like, it, it brings them in, even if it's only for a few months. They watch what they want, and then they cancel it. Or, you know, there's people like me where stuff is coming out literally, like, every week on Netflix. I haven't even started Ozark yet. And that's literally a show that takes place an hour away from me. <laughs> um, <laughs> because I'm still catching up on other stuff because I've got HBO now right now. So I want to use that while I've got it. Um. Netflix is always there, so I'll get to that stuff later, whereas some people have the opposite. You know, they might always have HBO, but they just start up Netflix, like, when Stranger Things happens. So they'll watch that and then watch a bunch of other shows while Stranger Things is going on and then cancel it. But, like, because they're putting all this money up there, like, entertainment is forever. Licensing fees, yeah, they might be monthly, yearly, whatever the case is. But, like, this original created content and stuff, like, they they keep that stuff. That's why they're making this big push. Because every month, stuff cycles off of Netflix. But what doesn't leave is that original content. Um, so the more of that they create, the more solid like back catalog they have, and the more they can make money in the future. So I'm not terribly worried about Netflix, but because they're a subscription-only model, which is not a very safe thing to do for your business, especially such a large business, they're really going to be struggling for a while. And if their investors start pulling out, they're a really good stock right now, which is keeping, which is what a lot of their uh, like assets are. You know, a lot of why they actually have value could go down. And if their stock goes down, they're going to stop getting a lot of that debt that they're getting right now because no one's going to want to invest in them. And that's when they could be screwed. But where they're at right now, it's they've probably got a good decade before they have anything to worry about. And in that time, they could be net positive because they've got so much stuff already in their works 
in 10 years, who knows what they'll be? They could be out doing Amazon. They could start their own, you know, other businesses. Amazon kind of went the other way, where they started, you know, with other stuff and then got into original content. Um, because they saw everyone else is doing it and, you know, they figured they could do it too. Now they're getting into games, all that stuff. Um, but, like, you know, Netflix started out as a movie rental company. And now they're one of the biggest original programmers out there and have won, you know, more Emmys in their time than most networks have total. Uh, so, like, I don't see them going anywhere. Like, original content is where they're excelling. But I could see them possibly needing to do a change in their subscription model. Whether it's possible, because I think there's a few other shows they've released, like, on DVD or Blu-ray or whatever after the fact. Whether it's making a bigger push to that, um, so that they don't have to worry so much about, like, you know, people subscribing for one month to watch everything they've got in their library and then, like, unsubscribing. They could possibly put each season of a show out on DVD so that people own them and don't get Netflix. But they're paying, like, $40 up front for this thing rather than $10 a month to, yeah. you know, watch the show because they just don't think of it that way. They think, oh, I can just buy this instead of getting Netflix. Um, something they're gonna they might have to do something to change but I don't see them going anywhere I know I, I, I know Ben that you were about worried this. about that but um, I just looked it up just to verify before I say anything that they're the Netflix CEO and, and some other members of Netflix apparently have commented before about potentially putting out some of their original movies I don't know about mm. their shows but the movies in actual theaters um, and you can imagine that some of their movies would actually get, even if they put it out on Netflix at the same time as putting it in the theaters, there's going to be people that are just going to go to the theater to watch it because, you know, if you, if the, like, like that, what's it, Glow? Not Glow. Um, the one with right? Will Smith. Right, that's it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I knew Glow. Totally different right. things, but yeah. similar names. I get it. I, I, I watched Glow. Great show. Um, yeah, it was. The, uh, but Bright, that's the kind of movie where it might, I mean, it looks weird to me. I don't want to see it. But, mm. Um, it looks like the kind of movie where it actually could work with a theatrical release yeah. and a movie like that m would probably do well, even if they released it on Netflix and in the theater, just because people will a lot of times pay for the theater experience, the, the big right. screen, the, 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 the way the speakers are and everything. A lot of people pay for that experience more than necessarily watching the movie itself. Cause you know, they, they're how, where else do you get that experience? And it's really no extra cost to them. If so, anything, the movies yeah. buy the prints for those things, like or the theaters buy the prints to those things. Mm -hmm. uh, if they don't get a certain number of, of tickets sold, they actually lose money on the purchase they made of the movie. Um, so technically, Netflix would just make money up front by selling the, you know, the print or the digital print to the theater. And it would be up to the theater to actually like make their money back on buying it. So at that yeah. point, like Netflix comes out positive no matter what happens in theaters. <laughs> Even if it was, even if it was like a last ditch effort that they had to try as things are going down, there's definitely potential there. But as yeah. as as good as their history has been, if their only problem is financial issues, I could definitely see if they go bankrupt, somebody buying all the rights to everything and just kind of absorbing it and continuing Netflix with just the original content and stop licensing other content or something. I could see some. I found it hard to believe as successful as Netflix is. Um, if they screw up financially, that no other company would say, yeah, let's scoop that up and run with as much of it as we can. Yeah. And like I said, like Netflix makes enough. They could probably pay back this debt if they wanted. They just keep mm -hmm. racking it up because they see a benefit to the, um, to like the, you know, debt pay structure rather than just like using their own money on everything. Yeah. Uh, because there is benefit to that. Like as, from an investor standpoint, the more like there is a... It's all business talk. I'm not going to get too much into it, but, you know, I'm graduating soon, so I understand this stuff to an extent. Um, I've learned a few things in my business time. Um, they, they're, like, having a certain amount of debt actually looks good on your ledgers. Um, if you, because, like, Amazon, I think, is an example of one that, like, I think it's Amazon, uh, that pretty much exclusively puts all of their profits back into R&D. They don't really have much debt or anything. Um, and that can look bad because, like, investors don't necessarily want to be a part of something that doesn't you know get money from other people yeah uh you look so you look too closed off in private um if you're a publicly traded company you should have debt basically so all they're doing is, is saying hey netflix has a lot of debt are they okay 
but they also make billions of dollars every year and they're this shows they uh like these scales say kind of how much they've had year over year and like in 2013 um they had a little over six billion in uh short-term debt and less than one billion in long-term debt so now you know it's 2017 it's 4.8 billion in long-term debt and 15.7 billion in short-term debt but with how much they're making they could easily like pay down a lot of that debt if they wanted they're just not they're putting all of that and the debt into their projects um so if they just stopped making new stuff they could pay down that debt in a year or two and be fine they're just choosing to put their money and you know the the investors money into new projects rather than into themselves and there's not really anything wrong with that <laughs> you have to spend money to make money as they say i so. mean in all reality regular credit for credit um credit card companies and all that your your credit history your, uh, as, as an individual it works the same way they want you to yeah, maintain exactly. a balance owed while you also spend so mm-hmm. realistically it's not too big a surprise that big business would work the same way right but yes, this is a lot of debt. I, I get that. Um, but let's let's move on. That was a lot of like numbers talk and stuff, and I don't want to bore people. <laughs> um, so I guess we're to the point where we end the podcast, because I don't really have a good transition from that. So yeah, uh, Jake, plug your crap. Uh, okay, here's my script. Um... No, uh, I, <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why. <laughs> I make opinion. I just make. I just make opinion and rant videos and skits and and. Uh, um, yeah, I just uh, I I uh, don't do well at promoting myself. I'm, I'm working on a big project. I'm hoping to have su- have done soon, but oh, um, cool. yeah, nice. Uh, I'm hoping to turn it into a series, but I got to get uh, my brothers, my <clears throat> my actors, uh, <laughs> availability up, and I got to get uh, the script actually completed. But nice, then, nice, this is nice. the this is the biggest thing I've worked on yet. So, um, but I, I've been streaming a lot more on uh, on my gaming um, YouTube channel as well as my Twitch channel, The Gaming Unwind. Um, playing a lot of PUBG. Yeah, so, PUBG. Yeah, had a nice had had a lot Pub of warm squad? up actually. <laughs> had had a nice little warm up actually before playing with you guys yesterday. So that was nice. Uh, and your other channel is Internet Unwind since you didn't yes. say it. Yeah, that's that's the one that no one cares about. That's the one I have the most fun with that no one cares about. <laughs> that's what's gonna pick up though. Gaming channels are dying. Uh, like it oh, yeah. sucks, but it it is it's happening slowly. There's still a small group that really love it, and like I don't see why anyone would quit doing gaming channels if they enjoy doing that. But yeah. it's not the lucrative thing at this point. I don't think it's, a fun uh, it's the side. thing you do on the side. I still fight the good fight. No, I know. That's what I'm saying. It's like, if you want to do a gaming channel, still do it. Like, I would, I don't see, that's kind of one of those things where it's like, it's still experience. It's still something you can, you know, like, use to your advantage. But it's just not the thing that's going to get you famous anymore. Um, Couchop is a good oh. example of a channel that, like, they mix, like, doing skits and gaming and, and pranks and stuff all into one video. It's pretty cool. Oh, that's cool. Challenge accepted, Zero. Fair enough. Prove me wrong. And by the <laughs> way, plug your crap. Uh, go to twitter.com slash marvelous Iggy for all things concerning the self-proclaimed marvelous one. Uh, just give an update. Uh, we are officially 13 days away from the release of Sonic Mania, which means we are 13 days away from the potential release of my next X play, which is Freedom Planet. Again, uh, just look for if you want to know where to find it, just go to twitter.com slash marvelous Iggy. Look for an update, and uh, yeah, get on your furry side. Nope, that's not a slogan. That that didn't sound weird at all. No. I am Justin. That's I am at zero score. Writer. Nope, we're on to me now. You you <laughs> you had your time. You ruined it. <laughs> um, I am at zero score on all the places I exist. Um, I am pretty much just doing Final Fantasy VI story play right now uh, on YouTube. I haven't had any time for anything else lately for obvious reasons. Um, the first like act, quote unquote is ending this weekend i was actually debating taking like a week break between each act but i did the math on that and realized that then the series would end literally on the day of my wedding and i was like i can't handle that so we're not taking any breaks but it is still like an act break uh it's kind of like you know the this thematic like story breaks 
there's just not going to be any actual like you know time break in between them because i want to get it all done before you know life gets crazy um and also while we're on that note please audition for final fantasy 9 i am begging you <laughs> everyone out there please audition there's so many characters and i'm starting to stress because we're into august now <laughs> um so yeah that that's that's my pitch um but that's all i got so thank you all for joining me uh i think we had a really good talk we we bonded we shared some laughs some some tears some stories i feel close yeah me too um but i already said thank you for joining me so i i guess uh yeah until next time stay charged sorry that got awkward (laughs) sounds like one of my outros screw you jake paul (laughs) One last shot in.